we go ahead and just open um, and do public comments and give Jack time to get here? Sure. Okay. All right, so the Hamilton Island School Committee will call their meeting to order. It's 6.32. Um, oh, it looks like we don't have the pledge, so that's fine. So we are going to open up our um, citizens' comments. Uh, nobody had contacted me in advance saying they wanted to speak. There is someone in the Q&A who said they would like to speak. Um, so if you would like to speak, we want to remind you that um, you have three minutes to um, say whatever it is that's on your mind. Um, Michelle Horrigan sets the timer. If you are exceeding your time by more than 30 seconds, she's going to put up her hand and also verbalize that it's time for you to stop. So uh, please respect that so that we can stay on time. We have four candidates to interview. We have our board of selectmen here. Um, we have our official team here at all. But those people would appreciate that we um, stay on time. Um, other things, just to let you know, this meeting is being recorded. This meeting is being held remotely due to the governor's um, emergency order. And I think that's it for now. So if you would like to speak, um, go ahead and use, when you push on the participants and you see your name, there's a little place that says raise hand. Um, and that would be the time to raise your hand. I think what are we, we're allocating 10 minutes to the, for this. So that gives like three or four people time to speak in the event that we go beyond the number of speakers of time, we will take down your names and allow you to speak at a future meeting. So um, did anybody raise their hand? Nobody raised their hand. In the Q&A, we have Rachel B. I don't know if you can find her in the participants list alphabetically, but it is easier if you use the raise hand because that brings you to the top and it's very easy to find you. Otherwise, we have to scroll through all the names to find you. Thanks. Here we go. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Rachel. Rachel, you should be all set. All set. Thank yes. you. When you, um, when you speak, if you can just state your name and your address, that helps us locate you in case we need to spell your name correctly. Absolutely. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Rachel Barstow, 5 Moynihan Road. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of a number of parents in our district. As of this evening, there are over 170 individuals in a parent group, 60 of whom attended a Zoom call this evening to discuss ongoing concerns with the district's decision making. The most pressing issue and concern is the COVID response team and superintendent's decision for the sudden shift to remote learning this past weekend. The decision to shift to remote learning and email that followed lacked transparency and contradicted previous communication. In Superintendent Banyos' email on November 28th, she outlined one factor leading to the decision to pivot being the inability to acquire testing appointments, an increase in result reporting, which would hinder families and staff who may have traveled for Thanksgiving to return to school given the delay in getting their testing results. This message was a clear contradiction to what the school district had been telling parents and staff about traveling leading up to the Thanksgiving holiday. It also appeared to accommodate those who did not abide by the state guidance. The last minute pivot not only posed great challenges to families and staff to make preparations and arrangements on such short notice, but it also is not supported by science and data and is contradictory to the guidance of the state as well as recommendations of medical experts. We are well aware of the challenging decisions needing to be made by all during these unprecedented times, and we appreciate those efforts. We have also supported our children through the last nine months of this global health crisis and our concerns about the students in our district unfairly and unnecessarily falling behind is growing. To date, our students have spent about 15 days in school under the tutelage of their classroom teachers. Their peers in other districts have been in person with their teachers for as many as 40 days or more. As a group, we implore transparency, honesty, and accountability, and request that the COVID response team, superintendent, and school committee considers the implications of further decision-making regarding learning model shifts and the significant impact it has on the children of Hamilton and Wenham. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you for abiding by the time limit. We appreciate that. Um, is there anybody else raising their hand? Yes, we have Pamela. Oh, okay, we, great. Oh, she, the other person who had said she wanted to speak in the thing. Oh, yeah. there's several people. So we have Pamela, and then I don't know how they came in order. So at this point, we have Jack, Paul, and Alexandria. Alexandria, Alexandra. So in the event that um, each of those people take three minutes, that will expire our time for tonight. Okay. So your brevity would be appreciated by others who want to speak. <laughs> Pamela, you're all set to speak. Yes, good evening. Hi, it's Pamela, um, Pamela Millman Stein. And I just want to say thank you. And I look forward also to the December 9th special forum um, meeting that's going to be open for some true dialogue and back and forth with the school committee. And appreciate that as late as it is, considering that was determined to happen um, I think it was determined on October 21st and is yet to happen. I think that would have been helpful having it earlier, but I really look forward to that December 9th meeting. So I actually am talking about, and I wanna thank um, the school committee for noticing and being proactive in some ways regarding the religious policy, but I know the calendar is being voted on tonight and I continue to see things that are discriminatory, such as the Friday day that's considered Good Friday and that it's a holiday. And I, I spoke previously about the policy policy and the religious policy of the district in consideration. And I think it needs to be looked on with consistency. There is really no time for discrimination and alienation or marginalization of any group in any way. And this is one of the ways in which the district needs to act and act with a level of immediacy. When something is recognized such as this, it should be addressed with a level of urgency and not just for the optics of recognition, but really for action to remedy the situation. And this also lends itself to the policy around the dress code for graduation for girls to be wearing dresses. Um, we have a really hard time with that. And I think the district needs to take a look at all of this. Issues of equity um, are happening all around us. We need to look at how we do it as a district um, to make these changes. So I'm, I'm hoping that the school committee um, really looks at this, um, looks at this calendar, looks at the dress policy of graduation and looks at the sports and equity as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Pamela, for the record, we need you to state your address also, please. Thanks. Oh, my address is um, 135 Lynn Street in Peabody. Thank you. Next. Oh, it doesn't matter. Just any of those ones that we had. So um, there's a Jack, Paul, and. So Jack should be all set right now. Okay. And Jack, if you can. It, oh, is this, is this Jack Wilhelm? Yeah, and mute, let's see. Oh no. Hi, Jack. All right, great. That is you. We thought you were one of the um, people in the public that wanted to speak. So great. Uh, we're just going to hear from two more people. Um, so Paul Gamber. Paul, you should be all set. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, Paul, great, thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, Paul Gamber, 16 Juniper Street in Wenham. Uh, I just wanna reiterate a couple of things and follow up what Rachel said. Uh, I totally agree with everything she said. And just as a, uh, in addition to, um, I feel like that the <clears throat> COVID response team is kind of being hid behind as far as, um, almost seeing as in, instead of being an advisory group, being a decision-making group and the superintendent letters to the public seem to indicate that they're making the decision whether or not the school should be open or, you know, for in-person learning or hybrid or remote learning. And so um, and I really think that the interest of the students is what's most important. And I don't think that's really happening. Um, the people who 
decided to travel, whether they were students or administration, um, it seems to be a small percentage of the people in town, but it affected a large percentage of the people. And I feel like um, a small percentage of the people that didn't follow the guidelines shouldn't be enough to shut down the school system and make it a fully remote thing. <clears throat> I agree with Rachel that the timing was poor. And if we kind of thought it out ahead of time and said a lot of people are gonna travel for the Thanksgiving holiday, we could have planned a lot more ahead of time uh, instead of giving people's two days notice to um, change uh, their plans for a fully remote learning session. Um, the number one thing is continuity of instruction during this time. And I think that um, that's not happening as Rachel said with the amount of learning in person that they're getting compared to um, other districts and compared to uh, private school systems. So it's not like we have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there's a lot of systems out there, school systems that are doing it successfully without creating a, a problem. And um, we should be kind of following some of those guidelines that some of those other school systems have been doing successfully so far. Um, and then the last thing is uh, safety of the students. Um, they're very experts all over saying, you know, from Dr. Fauci to other experts saying how important it is for kids to be in-person learning. And um, I still think that the superintendent and the COVID response team isn't being cognizant of that and not really following the state metrics and, you know, going back to the number of people that were positive for COVID being 34, 21 of which was from Gordon College, shouldn't really have affected our school system. Uh, so that being said, you know, I'm looking forward to tonight's meeting uh, and finding out what our goal is and what the metrics are gonna be going forward so that we keep, don't keep re, re, uh, returning to a fully remote model and we start towards an in-person learning session. Thank you. Thanks. And um, Alexandra. Alexandra, you're all set. see her she didn't come to the screen oh there she is okay hi can you hear me now we can thank you just uh, if you want to state your address sure 167 main street in wenham my name is alex overton i just want to echo um the uh, uh previous to rachel and paul um i'm here in support of the same group of parents who's now mobilizing um, to take some action, um, as we feel like we haven't been heard individually over the past three months. Um, so you'll be hearing more from us. And um, I wanted to echo uh, Rachel and Paul said it best. Um, we need to get the kids back in school. Um, and I'm here to adamantly um, suggest that you do everything that you can in your power to influence that decision um, to get the kids back in school, especially early elementary, as soon as possible. Um, that's all short and sweet. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Super. Thank you. Um, just so all of those that um, spoke tonight are aware, um, next Wednesday, we are having a, um, what we're calling a dialogue. So we're gonna have like an hour, um, sort of like a coffee dialogue question answer type thing. Um, so you're welcome to come there. And this in no way is meant as a criticism because I've sent lots of emails to the school committee and stuff before, but um, if you can send them earlier because I personally did not I saw that I had a bunch of emails but there was no way for me to read them um because I can't get to them until after work and that there's only a short period of time between then and the meeting um so we look forward to hearing more from you because that helps us to make decisions so thank you Mich Michelle would it be okay if I just made a couple of comments or um, I understand that we're in a deep uh it's a very tight time frame so if that doesn't work no worries could you could you do it under superintendent report? Sure. I okay. Super. And we can move superintendent report up if you want. So Chair, <laughs> Chair Bailey, I, I have an odd question. As a as a member of the school committee, can I speak in the, as a as a non-committee, but just as a citizen? Can I under citizens' comments? 
What time is it? No, because I said I wasn't going to let them speak. Like, because cool. we've gone past the time. But um, Peter, if you want to speak after we do the interviews, we could t we can see if we can find a spot for that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let me just write that on here. Okay. All right. So um, we'd like to welcome the Wenham Board of Selectmen here tonight. Um, they are here to help us select um, a replacement member on our committee. Um, one of our long serving members, Stacy Metternich, uh, needed to resign. And um, so we put out a call for people to uh, put in their names for, uh, for interest. And uh, Wenham was able to find um, four people who are willing to serve um, out this term, which would have normally ended at the next election. Um, so whoever is appointed would have had to run for re-election, but at this point there will just be two seats that are up for election um, come this May. Um, ooh, yeah come this May. And so those people are Jennifer Carr, Julia Campbell, Leslie Potter, and Jen Caulfield. And so um, Gary and I put together some questions and uh, that way we can ask the same questions of all the candidates. Um, Jack Wilhelm also had a question that we've compiled into the list. So that's fantastic. And um, I was just going to talk to the people in order that they were on the list. Um, Michelle, Gary Norman, here. Geez, me, would you like to open your meeting? Yeah, let me open the meeting quickly. So uh, I'll open the uh, Board of Selectmen meeting for uh, 2 December uh, 2020 at the same uh, 632 uh, time. And I think we got the quorum here. Jack yeah. and John are on. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Um, and then just once we get through the interviews and we that we'll have some comparison, then um, when we have a larger group, it's sometimes difficult to figure out who the one candidate is. So we'll try and narrow it down to two candidates by um, saying who our top two would be and why. And then from there, if we need to ask additional questions, then we can. Um, or if it's possible that there will be one clear candidate, um, then we'll just move ahead and appoint that person. Um, the clerk, the town clerk has informed me that swearing in needs to be in person. Um, so she could not do that over Zoom tonight. So this person can be sworn in as early as tomorrow um, and the, just call and make an appointment. So um, do, you, do you wanna have Jennifer Carr um, come in as a panelist? Sure. Jennifer, you should be all set. Can you hear me? We can. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we can see that you're in San Francisco, the city by the bay, the other Hi. city by the bay. <laughs> um, so backgrounds are wonderful. Yeah, we wanted to give you an opportunity to make any sort of opening statement that you wanted to. Um, so I decided that I was going to apply for this position because I am an extremely interested parent. I've watched everything that's been going on in the school district for the last semester and over the summer and their parent and teacher concerns. And I think that I can help best by being a member of the committee and listening and actively working to make sure that our kids are getting the best education possible. I have over 20 years in education, working with both high school students and college students at multiple universities, every place from community college up through Harvard University. So I'm hoping that if I get elected, people will absolutely take advantage of not only my teaching experience, but my technology experience. I've been using Zoom for the last five or six years, as well as Canvas and other types of classroom management systems. So I'm coming as a well-educated, experienced person with classroom technologies. Um, do you want me to ask the first couple of questions, Gary, and you would ask the next couple, or do you have the list 
Andy. Can't hear you, Gary, sorry. <laughs> of you so why don't you just go through them one at a time i think is easiest okay um great so jen in your opinion what is the district doing well what are its challenges and how would you work on the committee to improve them i think the district is doing the best that they can budget wise to make sure that money is spent effectively in a relatively tight time period I know some tough decisions have had to be made this year and I definitely think that we didn't always get what we wanted, um, but we got what we could. You know, I think you guys worked for the, for the best that was possible at the moment. I think the one thing that needs to be worked on is communication. I think what's happened since the summer has built distrust in between teachers and parents and the school committee and administration. And I really think open and honest communication is necessary to rebuild that relationship. Um, you, you spoke about this a little bit in your opening statement, but um, is there any particular area of interest or strength where you feel you could offer a level of expertise on the board? I am, I think I would be excellent in curriculum based decisions. Um, I have lots of experience with various types of curriculum and was on the curriculum committee at at least two universities that I teach at. I also think I would be extremely good at budgeting as a biologist, particularly a muscle physiologist. I'm very used to working with large data sets and using statistical tools to analyze those data sets and looking for abnormalities and ways things could be improved. Um, do you think you would plan on running uh, for the full term in April? Absolutely. Um, how will you work with the local governments? What knowledge would you gain from our local officials and how will you implement that knowledge to rectify differences or build consensus through the district budgeting process? Again, I think communication is going to be important, doing communicating with parents and teachers and administrators to see what are shared priorities in a budget and what are maybe like we would really like this, but if we don't have the money, this is what goes. Um, you know, so trying to find that balance within the, both the government, the administration and the community so that people really understand where their money is going. So you'll be starting on the committee just as budget season starts. How would you come up to speed on governmental budgeting processes? Um, I would probably go back through and read previous minutes from the school committee. I do know how budgeting works for biology departments and organismal biology departments, so I do have some experience there. Um, I would ask for advice from people who have been through the process at least more than once and clarification. I think it would be very important for me to ask questions both into inside the meeting and outside the meeting um, for clarification. So, and I would go through the budget documents very carefully. I would take my time and go through if necessary, line by line and ask questions. Like if we have this much budgeted for X, where's that money actually going? Uh, so I think a asking clarification questions is gonna be very important. Um. And as you heard earlier, the um, model or modality of how we are learning is very important to the community. What criteria do you feel should be used to um, decide on our educational models, remote, hybrid, or other? So as a person who teaches immunology, at the beginning of the year, I was for remote. Um, I understand how the virus is spread. I've spent all semester working with my immunology students to go through the data, as well as the symptoms and the issues behind this and the epidemiology. Um, that wasn't what the community wanted. 
they wanted to go hybrid and I understand why they wanted to go hybrid. I think with that decision made, we have to determine what the best is for our students. And as the data shows, particularly young students, kindergarten first and second, really need that in-person time. You know, my seventh grader can do just fine on Zoom, but I know my third grader has a hard time after a couple of days. Uh, and it's just, it's different learning styles. So I think at the moment we need to prioritize early education as well as integrate technology into the classrooms. I've been lecturing via Zoom all semester and I do a combination of asynchronous and synchronous class work as well as large and small group work, uh, which seems to work. And it seems to have worked to build a community, which was very, very important, I think, in an asynchronous format. And we did some activities that they were absolutely silly, but it made people laugh at each other. And so they were much more comfortable, comfortable with each other and with that learning. Thanks. All right, great. Thank you. If you want to just hang out for a few minutes, <laughs> well, probably like 40 minutes, <laughs> that would be great. So thank you. And Jennifer, I'm going to move you back to an as an attendee, and then we'll call people back as, as needed. Okay, thank you. Um, Jennifer, are you on Meridian? Is that right there? Uh, the Board of Selectmen minute taker just needs your address. You're on, she's on Meridian, right? Let me pull her back up. <laughs> uh, I mean, obviously we can look it up on the exhibits. I mean, yep, although she's we at five, to, Meridian. Yeah. Meridian, so she's on Meridian. Thank you. And then of course, from there, we can find you in the nosy book if we have to, I guess. <laughs> um, who's next on the agenda? Next on the agenda is uh, Julia Campbell. Julia, you should be all set. All right, welcome, Julia. Hi, thanks for having me. No problem. If you could just um, give us, you know, your opening statement. My opening statement. <laughs> I have prepared remarks because I am channeling Leslie Nope this evening. Um, so <laughs> I just want to thank everyone for giving me this opportunity. Um, Thank you, Selectman. Thank you, school committee. Um, thank you, superintendent. And to all the parents watching, um, my name is Julia Campbell. I grew up in Beverly and I attended all public schools when I was in Beverly. I firmly believe in public schools and I believe that schools are the real backbone of civic society and you can't have a functioning economy without schools and you can't have an informed electorate without schools and really nothing can happen without schools. And as a mother of two, I have a kindergartner. He's at Buker. I have a sixth grader. She is at Miles River. Um, I was drawn to the school committee protocol that the school committee represents the needs and interests of all students in the district and places the students' interests above all others in their decisions. And I really, I have some concerns around the handling of the pandemic, like the parents were saying and like Jen was saying, but honestly, I'm in this for the long term. And I want to make this a community and a school-wide community that my children can thrive in for years to come. So the pandemic is one thing, but I want to express to you that I am in this for the long term and for for years to come. And I should say we've lived in Wenham since um, 2016. Super, thank you. Um, so the first questions, they're, they're all the same. Um, mm -hmm. In your opinion, what is the district doing well and what are your challenges and how would you work on the committee to improve them? So of course we have to address two different issues here. One is the strengths of the district, which really drew my husband and I here. And I hate to say we moved here for the schools, but that's actually what happened. We were very concerned with class sizes in Beverly. And we were also concerned with communication and just sort of the way um, boys were 
not experiencing the same results in school. There's a huge disparity in Beverly for whatever reason between the sexes. And my husband in particular was very concerned that my son would not do as well um, as my daughter as he would if we moved to Hamilton one because there was a lack of disparity. And we have had a really fantastic time here. My daughter was at Winthrop we actually moved here. We live on Birch Road, which is zoned for Buker. But when we moved here, Buker was full. So we were zoned into Winthrop and we had an absolutely fantastic time. The buses were fantastic. The teachers were wonderful. The extracurriculars were wonderful. We really had and just an incredible experience. And then this spring, we were pretty dismayed by the lack of communication and especially the lack of infrastructure and formal instruction. And I understand completely that we can't necessarily compare ourselves to other districts, but if we look at districts like Gloucester, which of course, and I've got the statistics, we have a 63% higher income, average household income, if you combine Hamilton and Wenham, than Gloucester. And we have a 36% higher household income than Beverly. And both of them managed to do more communication and more remote instruction. And now they are sending their elementary school kids to school five days a week, both of those districts. So what I'm saying is I think there's room for looking at what other districts are doing. And there's definitely room for explaining and more transparency around the decisions that the school committee and the COVID task force makes. Um, but beyond coronavirus, because coronavirus is not gonna last forever, I do think there are significant long-term challenges. And I was reading um, the secondary opening, reopening update slides, the middle school slides, which everyone's gonna see later. And I see some pretty concerning trends. So I see a lot of a lot of talking about these trends, but not a lot of action on them. So namely the loss of teaching positions, the loss of teaching groups, um, elimination of world language in sixth grade is hugely concerning to me. Um, specifically, we were very excited <laughs> to get my daughter interested in learning a foreign language. Um, and also increased teacher stress was very, very notable to me. So, you know, none of this is sustainable or tenable, I think, for a growing and vibrant school district. So that's what I would see as some of the strengths and some of the challenges. Super. Um, it sounds like you've already answered this, but we're going to go ahead and ask anyways. Um, do you plan on running for a full term on the committee in May? Yes. Super. Um, how will you work with the local governments? What knowledge will you gain from local governments and how will you implement that knowledge to rectify differences or build consensus through the district budgeting process? Um, well, I have my master's in public administration um, and I was planning on using that to actually run for local government or either lead a nonprofit. Um, and currently in my current role, I run my own business, my own consulting business, and I work with local governments and nonprofits. And I've always been pretty active um, in civic life and, and pretty involved. I think that in terms of um, building consensus, I wanna echo what Jen said. I think that there has been a serious schism in the trust between parents and teachers. And I've been seeing it not just on social media, I've been seeing it with my friends, I've been seeing it in my neighborhoods. And I think I'm, I'm definitely guilty of you know, maybe jumping to conclusions and not saying things necessarily in the perfect and right way. But that trust needs to be built back up before there can be any consensus. And any kind of consensus building starts with a lot of listening and a lot of empathy. And I know, especially with my work in the nonprofit sector, people often just want to be heard um, and they want to be treated with respect and humanity. But what I will say with consensus is that families are struggling. We need a true consensus. We can't just say, this is what we're doing. We really need options and alternatives that work just as effectively for students and teachers and parents. Of course, we're never going to find the perfect one size fits all solution, but I think we need to do a lot more 
talking. We need to do a lot more of making sure that people are heard. Even just the parents at the beginning of this session, I thought they had fantastic points. And I really, I wish there could be more of that kind of consensus building more than just paying lip service, but actually getting people's feedback and taking action on it. Um, so you'll be starting right as we kick off our budget season. Mm -hmm. um, how would you come up to speed on the government, governmental budgeting process? Well, I've worked with budgets before. Um, I actually worked with the mayor of Beverly quite a few years ago, and I've, I've worked with nonprofits on their budgets. And as we know, um, budget cuts and resourcefulness and striking things from the budget. I mean, that happens all the time in the nonprofit sector. The other thing I want to say is that I'd be happy to, I would love to actually meet with each of the school committee members one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I would, as Jen said, read the minutes and I would read up on the budgetary process. And I'd be happy to talk to the selectmen and, you know, kind of take into account any information that was presented to get up to speed. Um, so earlier tonight, there were some parents who spoke about concerns about our switch in modality. Um, but in general, what criteria do you feel should be used when deciding on our educational modes, whether they're remote, hybrid, or something else? I think we should use the state criteria. And I know that changes kind of frequently. I also think that we just have to do the best with the information that we have. But I completely, I do agree with the parents that the decision that was made around the travel restrictions was pretty rash. And I know that other communities didn't do that and responded differently. So I'd love to see more explanation of why we chose decisions. But for me, I think prioritizing the early grades doing it as safely as possible and taking it week by week, which is what we've been doing and really trying to, trying to kind of push the envelope, but not so it's not so it's dangerous, if that makes any sense. So really going by the state guidelines, going by best practices, going by what we know. I mean, I'm not an immunologist. I'm not a doctor going by what we know to potentially be safe at this point in time, of course, two weeks from now that could change, a month from now that could change and constantly being able to adapt and, and iterate, but having a real set of standards. There's also no one size fits all. We can't have a one size fits all for the high school that's gonna match the kindergarten. I think that studies have shown and research have shown that different age groups are, you know, react to the virus in different ways. So. I would refer to state health authorities. And I do have to say that my daughter actually quarantined for two weeks after a, um, a student um, tested positive for COVID. And the response was absolutely amazing. Um, her, the public health nurse was fantastic checking in every single day, updating me, letting me know that the quarantine procedure had changed. Um, and I would just love to see more of that. I was sort of like, where was all of this when she wasn't in quarantine? <laughs> so more transparency, more adaptability. Um, and you know, we're, we're just kind of doing, I know that we're all doing the best we can, but let's do what we can with the public health data available. So Massachusetts state data. Super. Great. Thank you. If you just want to thank you a little bit in case we sure. have more questions and we appreciate that. Thank uh, you. The next person is Leslie Potter. Um, and Leslie should be all set. Um, and let me move. I think I'm going to move you back to an attendee. Yeah. So Julia is on Birch, and I think Leslie's on Gusset. Yes. Three Gusset Road. Great, Leslie's on Gusset for the record. <laughs> Hi, Leslie. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me tonight. Thank you. Can um, you see me? We cannot right now. Oh, okay. Why is my camera? Um, I'm so sorry. I hadn't been able to check that before. Um, I'm so sorry. I don't know why I'm not showing. Okay. Do you have the, the video on the bottom there? 
I don't. I just have the mute button, which is strange. It may be that you didn't enable it at some point before. That is strange. Should I go out and come back in or what, what would you prefer? Sometimes that works. Okay. It appears that she's in the um, panelist superintendent. No, oh, let's see. Let's and Mark is talking permitted. I don't know if she's been moved to uh, yeah, the panelist call. Ah, there we go. The panelists cannot, yeah, show the video. Okay, can you see me now? Not yet. I'm trying to find you over in the. Oh, okay. Sorry. Let's see. Yeah, Gary, I was a um, attendee in something a couple of days ago, and it was so frustrating. I was like, I want to know who else is here. <laughs> I, I think uh, she's actually at the top with her hand raised. Ah, uh, there we go. Thanks. <laughs> okay, Leslie, let's try that. What kicked her out? Let's see if she comes back. There she's back. Okay, now I can start my video. Great. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hi. Hello. So uh, welcome. Um, if you would like to just give us some sort of an opening statement, that would be great. Sure. Well, thank you for having me here tonight. I decided to apply for this position because I truly believe that, especially in a smaller community like Hamilton Wenham, we really rely on a lot of collaboration and teamwork from citizens and community members. We need to tap into each other's knowledge and ideas and experience to really help us make good decisions for the town. I grew up here on the North Shore, actually also in Beverly. My mom was an elementary school teacher there, now retired, and I attended public school there from kindergarten through high school. My family and I moved to Wenham six years ago and our two boys are currently at Cutler School. Since we moved here, I've really looked for a lot of opportunities to volunteer in the community. I've been a youth sports coach. I sat on the council of the Hamilton Wenham Mothers Club. I was the co-president of the Friends of Cutler. And most recently, I've joined the Hamilton Wenham Ed Fund Board. So these positions have all required teamwork, organization, and a really positive solutions-oriented attitude, which are all things that I have. Professionally, I've spent the last two decades at a company um, where really our goal is to open the world through education. And I've worked with teachers from all over the country in um, my roles there. I've managed sales teams there. And for the past decade, I've worked as a data analyst for my company, uh, which has given me the opportunity to work with the leadership team to make strategic decisions looking at quantitative, but also qualitative and, and anecdotal data as well. So I felt like my skill set and my experience um, was, would be a really good fit for the school committee. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so in your opinion, what is the district doing well and what are its, its challenges and how could you work on the committee to improve them? I think that one of the things that our district does well and has done well is hiring our teachers and our staff. Our teachers, and again, I'm, I'm experienced with Cutler, but from what I hear from my friends at other schools, um, our teachers are amazing. They're accessible, they're kind, they're innovative. They've proven themselves above and beyond over and over, especially these past few months. They're amazingly creative. I look at you know our buildings being older buildings, but the way that they use the space, the way that they use the gazebos or the outside space or the hallways or wherever it might be um, to really maximize our students' learning is just so impressive. And I think um, that also comes from the leadership of their principals. I know our principal at Cutler is very innovative in that way as well. Um, so I really think that you know our, our teachers and our staff are, are amazing and top notch. And it's important that we recognize that and that we do what we can to continue to retain them and also you know acquire new teachers that are like that as needed. For the challenges, um, obviously one of our immediate challenges I think is the the COVID uh, pandemic that we've been in, um, and the this is something that none of us have had to make decisions about before, something like this. We don't have a handbook to refer back to. We don't have things to look back on. Um, and some of it is you know, trial and learn as we go and ask questions and try to figure things out. Um, along with that and somewhat related, I know we've had challenges with, with our budget and just being limited with, with the financial resources that we have. Um, and you know, I think looking at the investments and spends that we're doing in the short term um, you know, we want to think about how we can 
how we can maximize our budget and maximize what we're spending in the future. Um, I mentioned before, you know, being solutions oriented. And I think, you know, one of the silver linings from this is, you know, looking at some of maybe the grants that we've gotten and some of the ways that we've spent some of some of our money as far as bringing more technology into the classrooms, because these are things that when COVID is behind us, we might still be able to use um, if, if students might have to be out for a different reason for an extended period of time. So I think, you know, some of these, these challenges that we have, we've all learned at this point that we need to really think creatively. And I think that we can find some, some good in some of these challenges that we've had up to this point. All right. Um... So do you think you would want to continue on the school committee by running again in May? Yes. Yeah. Um, how will you work with local governments? What knowledge will you gain from local governments? And how will you implement that knowledge to rectify differences and build consensus through the district budgeting process? I think that one of the benefits of being in a smaller community as we are is that there are not it's it's easier to to get in touch with people it's easier to reach out to people it's easier to um talk with somebody who maybe has been in in that position before or been in your position before so i'm a big believer in asking questions um in doing my own research as well and and asking questions that might um surface from what i'm finding there um and just looking at you know some of the old documents and some of the old meetings and um looking i i have followed what we've done with the budget and everything before. And I do have some budgeting experience myself um, from different roles that I've, that I've been in. Um, but I think that, you know, it's, it's important that, you know, we work as a school committee together, but also that we work together with the others in our community who are, are serving the public too. And again, I think that it's a benefit that we are a smaller community um, because we are able to, to reach out and, and get in touch with each other more. And I think listening in these situations is huge. Um, asking questions, listening, understanding that there's not always one very clear answer. But again, the data analyst in me also, you know, is, is strong with numbers and comfortable working um, and looking at different scenarios in that way. Not afraid of a spreadsheet, right? <laughs> Love a spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah. Um, you will be starting on the school committee just as we start the budget season. How will you come up to speed on the governmental budgeting process? I would start by doing some research, um, you know, uh, on my own. There's, there is information out there for, you know, local as well as uh, more, more general information. Um, so I think that, you know, understanding where the different funds are coming from, what might be able to be, reallocated or moved or um, changed or anything like that, as opposed to what really can't be based on the reason that it's it's in that bucket for the budget. Um, I want to be familiar and familiarize myself with that. And, um, you know, certainly reading through through past, you know, looking at the past budgets, looking at past questions that have come up and asking and, you know, hoping um, being, you know, new in a position that I could ask my colleagues uh, for, you know, questions and clarification. Um, and I, again, I do think that one of the upsides of somebody being new is we all know that questions, even if we've been doing something for a long time, when somebody asks us a question, sometimes it helps us to see something in a new light. So mm -hmm. I would hope to be able to bring some of my experience in that way as well. Great. Um, so there's um, been some concern expressed um, tonight just about um, decision-making around our uh, mode of education. Um, but what criteria do you feel we should be using to make our decision about our educational models, remote or hybrid, or something else? I think at the end of the day, we all care about the safety of the students and the families and the staff. And I would never want to be in a position where we're making a decision that would compromise that. From the beginning, I have felt that it's also important to have an option for a fully remote program right now during these COVID times for people who can't be in school and who, who um, for whatever reason, whether it's themselves or a family member, it's, it's unsafe for them to be in a school setting. Having that option for a remote program is really important. That being said, um, I've also been a proponent for when it's possible and when it can be safe in-person learning. The longer we get into um, you know, the school year and into the year, we have data from across the state, from across the country, from around the world um, about how it might be able to bring students back safely and keep students in school safely. So I think that using the 
science and using the data and using the metrics that have been shown to be as safe as could as they can possibly be is very important. I also think that hearing from the community as, as we did um, earlier tonight and you know perhaps surveying the, the community again as, as we were surveyed over the summer um, could give some insights, more of that anecdotal insight into kind of what the feel from the community is about um, should we be in person um, or you know what other options there might be. Great, thanks. And if you don't mind just hanging around out there, that oh, would be fantastic. We may have more questions. Thanks for your time. Great. I'm gonna move you back to attendee right now. And that's the last person, um, Jen Caulfield. And Jen is on Juniper, right? Jennifer, you should be all set. Jen, you live on Juniper, right? Cute. Yes, I'm on Juniper. You can, can you see me or no? No. <laughs> Fascinating. Let's see. Do you see a camera? <laughs> Let's see. How's that? There we go. There you go. We're in. We're in. Perfect. Yes. Welcome to Zoom. Okay. Um, so if, did you want to make us some sort of an opening statement? Sure. I'm a 25 Juniper, obviously. Um, I have lived in Hamilton and Wenham both collectively for 22 years. We have three daughters, two have graduated through the district completely, one in college, one now gainfully employed, and a third daughter who's a freshman at the high school. Um, I have worked, as I like to say, a professional volunteer career over the last 17 years, pretty much, um, actively involved in the schools um, amongst some other nonprofits locally, but um, mostly dedicated my time through the schools, whether it's the friends groups or events. Um, I've also um, back a long time ago worked with an organization called Citizens for Educational Excellence, which was a political action committee. And we would partner with the school committee um, to work as far as scheduling coffees, or we would also, um, we had to form a political action committee to be able to fundraise because we would mail out communication. It was about communication for the budgets. Um, so that was a long time ago in a land far, far away. But um, that's, I guess, in short, my background as far as my involvement with the schools in the town. Um, in your opinion, what is the district doing well and what are its challenges and how would you work on the committee to improve them? Um, I will probably echo a lot of what's already been said. I think the teachers and our building administrators have done a fantastic job as far as trying to make this new normal as normal as possible. Um, being very creative in how to deliver curriculum project-based learning, you know, independent learning. Um, I think the school committee and the um, administration has done a nice job recently as far as trying to open up channels of communication, whether it was the coffees or the open forum that's coming and times that people have been able to speak up. That being said, I also think cha a challenge that is communication. Um, kind of clear and concise communication as far as you know, transparency could be improved. And I feel like I could certainly help with this um, across the board. Um, is there any er particular area of interest or strength where you feel you could offer a level of expertise to the board? I think since this is a short term, five month hit the ground running kind of position, my 17 years of being pretty active, I would say, as far as throughout the budget process um, with the, not just the schools, but the town information. Um, I think I would be able to, I've demonstrated I'm a productive committee member um, and willing to collaborate with other people. And I think that's probably outlined more in my time of 17 years. Um, I'm also somebody who's just willing to roll my sleeves up and get whatever needs to get done, get it done. So 
that's probably mostly the strengths I would be able to uh, offer. Um, do you have any plans on running um, to be reelected in May? Um, I will be honest and I will say that I look at this, I think it's almost like a perfect try on as far as does my personality and what I have to offer mesh with what the school committee needs and the same way back, vice versa. So that's, I would like to say absolutely 100%, but if I'm being honest, I think it's more of, you know, look at like an internship, <laughs> a try on period for everybody. Cause I think working on a committee, it has to be collaborative and people have to be able to gel. Super. Um, how will you work with local governments? What knowledge will you gain from local governments? And how will you implement that knowledge to rectify differences or build consensus through the district budgeting process? Um, I, I mean, in an ideal world, somebody who's joining the school committee has, you know, at least nine months before they're going to jump into this. And again, my institutional knowledge, I think, of just being around and being involved in the process previously would be helpful. Um, the biggest thing I probably would like to work on or what I would bring to it is to change. I feel like there's always been a very um, us versus them attitude, us being school supporters and them being people who, it's not that they don't wanna support school, but it's almost like they, they're look, looking at the budgets in silos as far as a town budget and a school budget, and it's really all one budget in my opinion. Um, as far as coming up to speed, I think I would probably like to sit down with both FinCom and Selectmen, or as you can through Zoom, <laughs> um, really and just try and gain as much knowledge as humanly possible and before anything has to be determined. Um, so you'll get to elaborate that on just a little bit more because the next question talks about um, you will be starting on the committee just as the budget season starts. How will you come up to speed on the governmental budgeting process? Um, I think, again, especially the, the term governmental budgeting process is a massive learning curve and um, would normally like to, you know, sit back and learn before you jump in, but that's not really a choice right now. Um, again, this attending as many meetings as you can virtually as much as your time would allow to, to just gain as much knowledge and, you know, pretty much as everybody else said is try and meet with as many people as possible. Um, again, a more collaborative, transparent, um, approach to any of it, I think is going to be beneficial for everybody, both town and school. Um, so what criteria do you feel should be used to decide on our educational models, remote, hybrid, or something else? Um, you know, first and foremost, I'm not a doctor. I lend, you know, would leave it to the experts as listen to the science um, and not even necessarily politicians. <laughs> um, I think it helps you. We also have to look at um the best way to deliver the curriculum. Uh, I'll be honest that I don't think our hybrid model is enough time in learning for our students and a la why everybody wants everybody to be in the schools. But I, I, I mean, I'm not sure what that solution is. However, um, I think also social emotional is a large piece of this that I don't think anybody's brought up as far as what's best for the kids, even, you know, beyond the educational piece, the social emotional toll that it's taking. And I know you have been working towards changing some of that, especially for the K and one, which is fantastic. And, you know, every, like everybody has to revisit and kind of shift on the go. That's just what it is right now. Um, I also think it's, really difficult to balance the two extremes. I think you have extremes of parents that do not want their children in school and teachers who do not want to be teaching and you're never gonna win both sides. And then there's parents that believe that the whole school should be attending full-time five days a week, just like pre-COVID. Um, and I think that somewhere in the middle of that, there has to be a spot, but I don't, I don't think anybody can ever please both sides. You know, there's no solution. Um, but again, I would defer to the experts in the science. There's 
what is that a problem is something that has a solution and a dilemma is something yeah. that just, so. <laughs> all right thank you if you wouldn't mind just yep. hanging around in the waiting room in case we have more questions sure um so do the board of selectmen want to kind of voice their opinions first or would you like the school committee or how would you want to manage that gary I can go first or just go alphabetical, whatever your pra past practices has been. Um, yeah, why don't, why don't the selectmen go first and then right. we'll go reverse alphabetical on us. So. <laughs> right. Very well. And I'll start it off. I'll say uh, thank you to all four candidates uh, applying for this uh, job. It's going to be a tough one, no matter who one is in there. I've uh, We've all reviewed the uh, resumes, but I'll say that uh, looking for narrowing it down to two here. I found Dr. Carr's resume, not just the science and STEM background, but also her extracurricular volunteer work has been very extensive. So I like that. And also uh, like the Miss Campbell's uh, little bit of foreign experience, uh, educational experience, perhaps in a little bit different direction as a consultant and so forth, but uh, data analytics. So I would uh, say uh, I would round it down first to Dr. Carr and Miss Campbell. Super, thank you. Um, Mr. Clemenzi? Ma'am, <clears throat> well, I am very impressed and I hope all four candidates will consider further community service if they're not in this arena at this, at this time, because we've, we've been very blessed to have four very solid people uh, on, the, on the agenda for tonight. Uh, bringing it down, uh, <clears throat> I would say I'm very torn between uh, Miss Campbell and uh, Miss Potter. And uh, I guess if uh, push comes to shove, uh, I, would, uh, I would support uh, Miss Campbell for, uh, for this position and hope that the other three will talk to both us, the Board of Selectmen and the schools uh, to see what further uh, possibilities there are for your wonderful ex expertise. And your, some of your commentary were very, very good. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, Mr. Wilhelm? I hope he's there because we don't, don't see him. I see him down the bottom. There he is. Yeah. Great. Hi, Jack. Hi, did you hear my first question? We did not, but go ahead. <laughs> Remind, who was the first presenter again? Uh, the first person was Jennifer Carr. Yeah, okay. And then the second person was... Uh, I, got it, I got the others. Uh, okay. Oh, perfect. Yeah, uh, yeah, I just didn't write her name down. So that um, I, actually I was impressed with the enthusiasm of all four candidates. Uh, they really want the job. Uh, they know it's not easy. And that uh, I think we're blessed to have four people who want to step to the plate in a very difficult situation with this uh, COVID business with uh, many of the uh, parents wanting the children um, in school most of the time and many others who don't want that. And that, uh, and the teachers who probably feel the same way. So that's a very, very difficult time. I was uh, impressed with the enthusiasm of all four candidates who uh, want to uh, jump in and help the district solve uh, uh, the problem by being a member of the Hamilton Winter School District. So I applaud the fact that uh, we have four candidates. I was surprised that uh, four people actually stepped to the plate and I was very pleased that, that they did. And that uh, I listened very carefully to all of them and that uh, uh, <clears throat> it's hard to narrow it down, but uh, I think that uh, I'm gonna uh, <clears throat> uh, offer two names that I think are different than the uh, my, my two other colleagues. Uh, um, one is uh, Leslie Potter and the other is uh, Miss Carr. And that those are my, uh, if we have to uh, narrow down to two and uh, not to disparage the other, Jen Caulfield and Julie Campbell, but uh, I think all four candidates uh, were worthy candidates for the uh, uh, vacant position. Super, great. Um, Peter. Do we have to go in reverse alphabetical order? Can I? <laughs> I am. Uh... We, can, we can go to Anna and come back. How's that sound? Yeah. Yeah, okay. or, yeah, come back to me because this is hard. Anna, go ahead. Um, thanks, Michelle. I also want to say thank you to all four candidates um, for 
I think it's different to run for something when you don't quite know what you're getting into, but the fact that you all volunteered knowing exactly how hard it would be is really something. So I just want to applaud the bravery and willingness to serve. Um, I think for me, uh, despite life, I like things about what everyone has said and they're all different. I think for me, my top two are also uh, Dr. Carr. I like her scientific background. Um, I'm looking at the board and you know she has a different background than any of the rest of us, as far as I can tell. I like the scientific side. I like the high level uh, teaching experience. I like the analytical mind, the curriculum development. So I kind of think she would have um, a diverse background and challenge us to do new things. So I, I would vote for Jen Carr as one of my two. And then the other, uh, for her, the same reason is Julia Campbell. Um, you know, I like the fact that she's got a, an advanced degree in public administration. I don't think anyone else has that exact degree. And as we've all discussed, you know, we work with the towns, we work with the FinCom, we work with all these other governmental bodies. And I think that's kind of a fresh take as well. I also like her international experience and um, a lot of her background talks a lot about diversity and equity. And um, those are very important issues to me. And I think that we need as much of that as possible. So if I had to choose, which I do have to choose, my top two are Dr. Carr and Julia Campbell. Peter? Okay. Um, I too, <laughs> I, I'm having a difficult time because I find, I wish, we, yeah. All, all four candidates are brilliant and dedicated to our students in our district. They each have elements that uh, make them ideal. <laughs> the science background, the public policy, the education background, the dedication um, to our students through the, the various uh, friends groups. I have to say that Dr. Carr's science background and, edu and education background um, are aligned with what I want to see as the decision-making process on the school committee, um, as well as her expertise in curriculum decisions. As you know, um, I'm a proponent that we should have our own learning management system. And I think she could help with that. Um, I liked how Ms. Potter wants, they, in fact, they all do use data to ensure students are brought back safely. She emphasized that a, a lot. Um, <coughs> um, if I'm forced to choose as, we all are, I'll have to, Dr. Carr and Julia Campbell. Okay. David? Um, for me, it's Campbell and Caulfield. I just wanna say, I think that of everyone on here, um, Jen Caulfield will probably, I could just see probably seamlessly transitioning on the easiest because she has been involved in so many um, town. But I just wanted to sort of bring that up just that, you know, we all, this is a lot different <laughs> inside um, the factory than it looks like outside of the sausage making factory. So um, just for that, that ramping on period, I, I think that <clears throat> I, I could see Jen being hopping on the most, but then I really like Julia's co um, comments as well. Um, Michelle Horgan. Um, and my first choice is Jen Caulfield, um, followed um, by Leslie Potter. And again, I'm gonna echo what David said about Jen, um, her institutional knowledge. Um, and again, it's much different being on the inside than the outside. So thanks David for voicing that so well. Um, but to follow the alphabetical pattern, I'll go next. Um, I only have a relationship with any of these people. Um, so I have two worked side by side with Jen Caulfield on 
many occasions, whether it was fundraising or, um, you know, going to FinCom meetings or the like. And I know that she has the knowledge of how budgets are made. So um, I would go with her. And um, the other ladies I've only ever met briefly, but I was very impressed with Julia Campbell. So that's would be my second choice or in my top two. <laughs> And Dana. <laughs> Sorry, I was having a little technical problem. Um, you guys can hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, so um, again, I was laughing when Anna said that, like it was crazy enough that Anna and I chose to run oh, in the God. ring, but this is truly impressive that people are stepping up at this moment. Um, I um, am also torn and I won't belabor it, but just know that I really had a hard time. Um, I um, am going to say Jen Caulfield and Leslie Potter are my two top choices. Um, I also share the, um, the thought about just uh, Jen Caulfield having the sort of institutional knowledge that, um, you know, I, I, I echo date what David said about just getting up to speed is just a steep learning curve, so. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> there we go, sorry, I was on mute. Um, so as I total it, I see that um, Julia, well, Julia Campbell has six um, people who would support her. Um, Dr. Carr has four. Leslie Potter has four and John Caulfield has four. Um, so because we did sort of like a rank choice voting but not really because we didn't put the rank to it. Um, I don't know if people feel comfortable with going with Ms. Campbell or if they would like to discuss some more. So um, I think that makes sense. You, you've got four highly qualified candidates here and you could tell because it wasn't a, a blow <laughs> in any way, you know. Um, <laughs> Sometimes it's very clear. You're like, oh my God. <laughs> you right. know? Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, how. I, do you, my th I my thoughts would be to, to help you. I think my thoughts would be the more we discuss this, the muddier the water is going to get. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> how do the selectmen feel? Do they feel that we should um, select Miss uh, Miss Campbell? Well, I speak for one of three, but I think uh, at this point, you might as well just go to a final vote. You know, it's, it's very close one way or another. So I would say go to the final vote and see if you can uh, reach the majority yeah. five. Okay. So um, we normally have Dana make the motion. Do you want her to make the motion or do one of the selectmen want to make it? Is this, is this motion to uh, proceed with a final vote? Yeah. Right, sure. Okay. Go ahead, Dana. Um, okay, just is and is my motion to uh, everyone's going to vote, or is my motion to vote on Julia Campbell? That is your motion, I think. To vote on Julia Campbell. Yeah, because no, I, I thought we we're going to go final vote, and it's you know all four candidates being so close. Oh, I see what you say. So no, uh, we, we have not said one our number person? one choices. So let's uh, say our number one choices by a final round of vote. Oh, okay, so let's do that. So let's just go around and say a number one vote. Um, so why don't we do, do you wanna do it in the same order? So we can sure. go first, Gary, okay. All right, do we need the motion first? Well, I think we're gonna see okay. if we have the same number one vote. All right, very well. Go ahead. Dr. Carr. Okay. Um, Lindsay then, Carr. Uh, I mean, Jack Campbell, I'm sorry, Campbell, Campbell. Oh, Campbell, okay. Sorry. No problem. They both began with C. Two C's. <laughs> uh, Mr. Wilhelm. Dr. Carr. Uh, Anna was next. Uh, Dr. Carr. Peter. You're muted there, Peter. Rookie mistake. Um, you think I'd know better. Uh, Dr. Carr. David. 
Uh, Julia Campbell. Uh, Michelle. Uh, Jen Caulfield. Uh, Bailey Campbell. Dana. My last. Yeah. Can you tell me the totals? <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, four, three, fair. and one. Uh, so it doesn't actually matter then, right? It does. Well, it does matter depending upon who you pick. <laughs> well, so it's it, right now, uh, Dr. Carr has four. four. And Dr. Mrs. Campbell. Campbell has three, and Mrs. Caulfield has one. Campbell, Ms. Julia Campbell. Okay. Ms. Caulfield has been eliminated. We now are at, why are we at four and four? Oh, why are we at? Four and four. It was four, 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 four one. Four, four, one. Oh, four, four, one. So now I guess we're to Mrs. Horrigan. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> we would all still vote the same. Um, I'm going to go with uh, Julia Campbell. Okay. So that did work out being that the person who had six by the sort of one, two also ends up being the person who has the most by the number one. Um, all right, so Dana, do you want to make a motion and we'll see where it goes? Sure, uh, is the motion to appoint, to appoint? Appoint, yeah. Okay. Uh, I move that we appoint Julia Campbell to the interim term, or is that right, interim? Uh, it's- um, To fill the remainder yeah. of the uh, term left by Stacy Metternich on the Hamilton Wenham Regional School Committee. Second. Second by Mr. Wolzik. Would the selectmen like to vote first? I think we're uh, going with uh, Ms. Campbell then, if that's the majority, we'll go that way. All right, so that's a yes from you? Yes. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Wilhelm? Uh, oh, I'm Mr. Clint. See, sorry, I was doing. <laughs> Who? Go ahead and, go ahead, Jack. I, I should have said. <laughs> Uh, I agree with Gary. Okay, Mr. Clemenzi. Aye, yes. Um, Ms. Cizik. Yes. Mr. Holtick. Yes. Mr. Pluto. Yes. Ms. Oregon. Yes. Yes, Ms. Alara. Yes. Super, congratulations to, uh, or condolences, however you wanna look at it, to Ms. Campbell. Um, you're welcome to join us in the panelists, but you won't be able to actually participate in the deliberations or vote, or you're welcome to take your first night off. Um, to the others, I just want to say, like, I, I mean, I knew Jen, but I, I didn't really know the rest of you. And I'm been so impressed that you um, came out. You had incredible resumes. You have so much to give. Um, there's so many opportunities in Wenham. Hopefully one of those will fit your skill set. And May is just a few short months away. <laughs> um, and, you know, we'd always encourage you to be involved in anything that you can. So that is great. Um, did the selectmen want to stay or did you want to adjourn? What would you like to do? I think we're ready to adjourn. Yes, Jack and John? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Then I'll make the motion that the Board of Selectmen meeting adjourn at 7.51, I make it. I'll second Aye. the motion. All in favor, Jack? Aye. John? Aye. Gary, I, we're right. adjourned. Thank you very thank much. Thank you Michelle. very much. And thank you very much to all four candidates as well. Thank we'll you, Superintendent, and uh, Michelle Bailey as well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Bye bye. We'll see you soon. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, congratulations, Julia. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, our very thing is super exciting. Um, we have our administrative team from the middle school, high school um, to give us a similar update that we got from the elementary school last time. So Superintendent Banyos, if you want to kick that off, that'd be great. Great. Thank you. Um, so at our last meeting, we heard from our elementary leadership uh, around what we have been doing since the start of school, what's well, what our community is telling us 
about what's working for them, what's not working for them, and ways in which we are adjusting pro uh, programming based on that feedback. So this evening, we had the opportunity to hear from um, Craig Hovey, our middle school principal, and Eric Tracy and Brian Menegoni from the high school to give the committee and the community a similar report. So with that, um, Craig, I'll turn that over to you um, so that you can talk a little bit about what has been happening at the middle level. Sure, thank you, Mary Beth. Um, are you able to share your, or share screen sharing ability so I can put yep. the presentation up? Just do the only thing Google Meet is better for. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody can share a screen. That's the only thing that's better than Zoom. <laughs> All right. You should be able to do it now. All right, can you just let me know if you can see the uh, presentation here? No, we cannot. We cannot, all right, so. Uh, wait a minute, let's, tr let's try this. All right, how about now? <laughs> I see it. Does it have something to do with screen mirroring? Let me let me try one more thing here. Ah, oh, there it goes, Craig. Great. All right, That's perfect. It. User error. All right. So good evening. I know I have an enormous amount of slides here. I promise I will not spend a lot of time on them because uh, I see the agenda is also rather sizable tonight. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that you had the information available to you so that you could take a look at it. And if the questions came up, I'm happy to discuss. So where have we been? How are we doing? And what's coming next are kind of the big three questions that we're looking at here at the middle school. Um, and normally I would thank people at the end, but I feel like everything we're talking about needs to be looked through a lens of thanks right now. This is incredibly hard for everyone. Um, our students are struggling, our parents are struggling, our teachers are struggling, um, and we are absolutely doing the best we can in a global pandemic. And I think if you, every day I have to tell myself that because you know, I know we could be in a different place if this was normal times, but it's not. Um, so I wanna put a huge thank you out to everybody for their flexibility, for their hard work, and for um, making sure we're doing what we can to support our, our students and families. So the journey so far, uh, this summer, uh, we had a tremendous amount of work done. Um, I think there was a summer, I, it was more or less just hot in March at that point. Um, so we collected um, and collected a lot of survey feedback and information about what was done in the spring. Uh, we reviewed that, we did some reflecting on the information to help us um, inform what we would be doing come the fall. Um, there was almost daily updates from health and educational agencies. So we were trying to stay on top of all of that new guidance in our planning. Uh, we pulled together some teacher design teams for a week of really, really great work. Um, it was some very thoughtful teams to look at the problems and the dilemmas uh, that we were gonna be facing and how we could best tackle them uh, we came up with some ideas, we reinvented those ideas, and, and we did that numerous times. Uh, and then we had a, a series of parent and teacher forums over the summer to inform the community of where we were. So there was a lot of work done this summer. Um, in addition to that planning, there was a tremendous amount of facilities work. I want to thank uh, Tom Geary and his, and his team for the HVAC repairs and updates that were done. Um, across the district, but you know, I'll focus particularly on our school. Uh, lots of motors were replaced, uh, filters were replaced, tons of updates. Uh, we got new furniture at the middle school. Previous to this, all of our all of our furniture was either two person desks or larger four person science tables. Neither of which were very uh, COVID friendly with the six foot social distancing. So we had, we've replaced an enormous amount of furniture. Uh, we've repurposed a lot of our spaces. Uh, so some places that were learning spaces are not currently learning spaces. Some places that were not learning spaces now are. Um, we, ha we had to make some adjustments. Um, one of the things that makes me kind of sad actually about this is that we've 
pulled people back into the classroom to sort of control social distancing during the school day. Um, in the past few years, we had really expanded outside of the classroom. So if you walked into the building, you would see kids working in the halls and the multi um, at various green screens around the building. Um, and, and our kids almost to a T would be respectful of that freedom and would you know, be able to go out and do videos and come back with no issues. Um, now it's, it's, really, it's really nailed down a lot more at the moment. Um, we also invested quite heavily in disinfection equipment. So our, our rooms are being sanitized daily. Um, so lots of, lots of facility updates that occurred um, this summer and early fall. Uh, some of the good things that came out of this, and I, I always like to put look highlight the uh, silver linings, is that we are using outside spaces a lot more. So thanks to the generosity of the friends, we have a lot of Adirondack chairs now, which the kids love using. Uh, we've got them in three or four different spaces around the school, and um, I hope to keep expanding that um, as the year goes on. We've sort of just opened the doors to the multi for lunches, so kids are sitting outside um, in all kinds of weather because they're kids and um, enjoying the, the freedom of, of sort of spilling outside. So I, I foresee that uh, extending well beyond this pandemic. And then we have some uh, nice log seating here as well from uh, Dodge Tree that donated those. So that was much appreciated. We've, uh, we updated our safety protocols across the district. So mask use, social distancing. Uh, we updated our um, sanitizers, dispensers, touchless faucets, paper towel dispensers, our in enhanced cleaning and sanitizing uh, protocols, and staff and student training. So uh, people are doing a good job with these things. So I, I will fully admit that social distancing for middle school kids is a challenge when it's in an unstructured situation uh, because they are naturally very social, um, social animals. They're very social, social children. They want to be together. Uh, but when you know, they get it, you know, they just need some frequent reminders. Um, in the classrooms and, and in structured settings, they're great. Uh, but mask use has been outstanding as well as the uh, sanitizing and hand washing. Crew is a, uh, a daily block that came up during the uh, teacher design teams this summer. And it, it was born out of our um, disconnect from our students on a daily basis this, spring, this past spring. So we developed crew where it's a small group of students, um, about 10 or so, and one dedicated teacher that they meet every day and to establish student and teacher connections, um, build some relationships within that crew. It's a, a mechanism for us to share information. And it's, it's been acting more and more as a two-way avenue. So um, students who have questions or concerns are asking their crew teachers who then find anybody who needs who, who has the answers to those questions and get that information back to students. Uh, and it's also our mechanism for daily attendance. So every day they check in with their crew. Um, I think overall it's been working. There's you know, varying levels of engagement and I, I see this growing. And I've, this is another piece that I would really like to keep in place um, when the pandemic is over. Uh, the opening of school um, came in a number of, of pieces. So we opened on the 14th in, uh, in a remote mode, what we're calling remote model A or remote model one. And that was, we had shorter blocks. Whoops, I'm jumping back here. Sorry about that. Uh, we had shorter blocks uh, and every class zoomed every day. Um, and the purpose of that is we wanted to make sure that students were building those connections in those opening days of school. Uh, we realized that that was probably, probably not gonna be a sustainable model as we started getting deeper into curriculum. And so we moved to the current model we have now, which is alternating blocks. So you would have three classes of uh, Zoom on one day and then the other three classes of Zoom on the other day. And that would alternate and the classes that you didn't have would be asynchronous. Um, and we did some surveys uh, after that with parents, teachers, and students to collect feedback on those models. And then on October 1st, we opened uh, in a fully remote and fully in-person hybrid models. And then just this week, we shifted back to a fully remote model, and we're, which was the remote model B. So how is it going? 
Um, we've been collecting feedback in um, information from parents, students, and staff uh, throughout the process. So as I mentioned, we had a, a full survey on the remote, the two different remote models, whole school remote models. So I just linked that here. Um, we conducted a survey on people's experience with their in-person hybrid and their fully remote experiences. Uh, and uh, that's where I've got some data below. We've, uh, on, before we opened the school year, uh, I conducted uh, a sixth grade, a seventh grade and an eighth grade uh, webinar for parents to sort of talk about what the model's gonna look like and answer any questions they might have. Um, we've had two superintendent and principal coffees so far. Um, and I suspect we will have some more, which was great because some really nice conversations have come out of those. And we have our monthly uh, middle school, high school friends meetings, and then just ongoing conversations um, through phone, email, just in-person conversations with our families, staff, and students. So we're, we're really trying to listen to what people's experiences are and help use that to help shape our, um, our, our next steps and our actions. Uh, so this is just an overview of the community survey results that we got back. Um, it, it opened a little before November 2nd, I think about a week or so, and closed on the 2nd. Um, I think at this particular point in time, people were experiencing a little bit of survey fatigue. Um, I would have hoped for slightly higher um, returns, but the information that we did get was, was really helpful and um, helped us, you know, it, it helps us think about our practice. So... Rather, the the uh, number of graphs that I'm going to show you uh, and comments are all there for review, but pulling out of those um, are three big themes that I, I see across the board. Uh, the biggest is that the same experience is experienced differently by different students and families. Um, it, for every person I've talked to who says there's not enough work going on, I'm hearing from another teacher, another parent that there's too much work or it's too much Zoom or not enough Zoom, or um, you know, I, I need my kid in school all the time, or I don't wanna send my kid into the building at all. There's such a, a dichotomy and, and a, a range of responses um, from all of our families and for good reasons on almost all accounts. Um, people see this as this is a, a unique circumstance and people have, um, are experiencing it in very different ways. The other one is that um, teachers or students and, and uh, parents are looking for more student teacher touch points, particularly on our asynchronous days. Um, I think that is the key. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the common cycles that I see is, you know, there was a, an assignment that was given to my child for an asynchronous day. It only took them 10 minutes. Um, and then you talk to the teacher and they said, well, it, they, they didn't do all of the work for this. Um, the student might say, well, I, I did. And what's missing is the, the normal flow that you see in a classroom where the student might say, I'm done. The teacher would check in with them in the moment and say, well, not really. Let's go back and expand on this and, and review on this piece and, and try this again. And then they would go off and do that. And then they'd check back in a few minutes later. But if that student is working entirely at home and the teacher is teaching five other classes that day, it's incredibly complicated to get the timing right. So that's something that, that we're working on and we're looking at how can we improve that. Um, and then the third one is, is looking for more social connections. Um, in a typical year at the middle school, we have um, you know half a dozen intramural activities going on. We probably have a dozen clubs musicals, plays, uh, musical groups going on. And most of those are not happening right now. Um, it's difficult just from a, a safety standpoint to run many of them. But the other piece is uh, these are almost ent all entirely run by our teachers and our teachers are really struggling with capacity. Um, you know, they, the, the amount of work they are pouring into these lessons and developing synchronous and asynchronous lessons, as well as managing their own children's uh, learning at home is, is just overwhelming. And they have not really been able to open themselves up to uh, a lot of these extracurricular activities we would typically have. So we're looking for ways to expand that. 
uh, without you know, burning people out. Um, so the survey data here, this is, um, this is student data on this one here, you know, asking about how much time on an asynchronous day uh, are you not, that you're not attending classes, are you spending on work? And you can sort of see it sort of broken out by uh, two to three hours seems to be the most, but we've got a good group that's more than three hours. I'm not entirely sure where option five falls in. Um, I will say that this is not the finest data analysis, um, but this is the level of uh, granularity that I was able to get done. And then when do you do your schoolwork on asynchronous days? And what I pull out of this, you know, there's a, a large number of responses is that kids are doing their work at different times. So some kids are excited and wanna jump right in in the morning and do their work. Some kids are doing their work at night. Um, so it, it varies much like a lot of what's happening in our, uh, in our learning this year. And then we broke it down um, by subject area. Um, and this is helpful for our teachers to take a look at. Um, so the, is the asynchronous, what do you think about the asynchronous workload on average? And we have family and student responses. Um, I do wanna caution people that, and I put a note on here, that the too much and too little colors are reversed between the two graphs. Um, and I think that's just a function of the way Google created them. Uh, so you just wanna make sure that you're lining the right uh, key up with the right graph. And this ties back to the different people and different, are, and different groups are having different experiences um, piece. So we have that for each subject area. Um, and then we asked a number of questions uh, about what is working well in synchronous instruction what is not working well in synchronous, what's working well in asynchronous, and what's not working well in asynchronous. Um, these are the sort of recurring themes or recurring statements or some key quotes that I thought really captured uh, the messaging. You know, we, there was some specific information to very specific students or incidents that were in there, but I didn't list that in, these, in this sort of overall summary. So this is what's not working well, what's working well with asynchronous, uh, what's working well, or what's not working well with asynchronous. And then we conducted the same survey with the students who are fully remote. Um, and these are students who are not coming into the school at all. So um, slightly different responses on these and a, a, a smaller pool as well. So, I'm gonna, I wanna pause there and, and see if there's any questions about um, any of that information before I, I jump into the next piece. I, I do have a very quick question, sir. Sure. This is Peter. Um, the, the old furniture that we got rid of, is that uh, still around? We didn't get rid of that, did we? Because I'm a, I'm a fan of those two person and <laughs> four person death. So I will tell you the, um, the, a lot of the four person science tables were basically deemed unsafe. Um, they, they had been around for 20 plus years. Uh, structurally, they were not handling it well. They've, and they'd per, uh, presented a yearly safety issue for our custodians because they could not, they can't be moved out of the rooms. They're too large. Um, so they had to be tilted and lifted, which, and they're extremely heavy. So. Yeah. Those were disposed of. The um, two-person tables we have still. We have all of those. Um, and what we've actually done is we've put about 60 of those in the multi-purpose room for our lunches. Um, and as well as in the, those are now in the science and art rooms because they're a larger, more stable surface. Okay. And I just, for a tip about the slide, about the colors being reversed, yep. if you go back to the survey and just slide change the order of the answer, it'll fix the color for you. That's, that's a good <laughs> thing. Thank the you. same thing happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things I unfortunately didn't catch until I was well into building the presentation. Um, right. even, so. even after they fill out the survey, if you just slide the answers into a different order, it'll change the colors based on that, because Google pre-selects the colors for you. Yeah. Trust. <laughs> All right, good on you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, so what's next? Oh, I'm sorry, Craig, oh. can I ask you a question? Yep, go ahead, Anna. 
Um, the survey data, you said it was a low return. What was the return percentage? Like I look, I did the math quickly. Oh. It was like 154 parents. What percentage of actual uh, parents actually did the survey? I'd say we have probably about 390 parents that um, would have potentially been able to do it. Okay, so like a third, maybe? Yeah, maybe about a third. I, okay. I believe we had higher returns on the earlier survey. Um, okay, um, and this isn't so much, a, it's a little bit of a question, a little bit of a comment. The, the process that led to going to remote model B, the Tuesday, uh, Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday, yep. there was a survey involved, but can you walk me through sort of the thought process about doing that. Um, and the reason I'm asking is that that was sort of done um, without notice isn't exactly the right word, but you know, the school committee wasn't involved in that. A lot of parents were not involved in that. And it came as a bit of a surprise when it first got ruled out that there was this kind of major schedule change happening in remote bottle B. And so I'm trying to understand how, how was that decision reached and, um, you know, if you could just talk me through a little bit how that came to be, because it was a surprise to me and it was a surprise to a lot of other people when it happened. I think ultimately it seems like it is working pretty well, obviously. I think the data sort of supports that, but I think the initial switch was a bit of a surprise. So can you go back a little bit and help us understand that process? Because I think I'd like to try to avoid the surprise switch again, if we have to, if that makes sense. So. And, and I may be, I'm, I'm speaking from slightly foggy memory here at this point, um, but the intention was that the remote model B was the model that we were going to use. But when it became apparent that we were gonna be opening the school year uh, in a remote setting, we realized that that was not an ideal model for you know, getting to know kids. You know, if you have math on you know, day two, starting your first day of school and not seeing your math teacher is not a great way um, to get to know and start building those uh, relationships. So that's when we sort of developed the model A where you would have shorter Zoom sessions and then without overwhelming kids with Zoom right off the bat of seven, you know, 50 minute Zoom sessions. Actually, I, and I guess there was another model I was referring to, which was the one that was in the plan that was two long days and three asynchronous, which is what the elementary was doing. So maybe in that way, because um, I mean, when people, we first saw the plan and approved the plan, it was with the idea that if you were cohort A, you'd be, you know, Monday, Tuesday, synchronous teaching, three days asynchronous, and then it was switched to Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, Friday to break it up, which I, you know, I don't think was a bad decision. But that was a surprise to people. They were expecting the schedule to be the same as the elementary school. Are you following my question? Yes, but I, I and and unfortunately, I'm not sure that I can effectively answer that, Anna. At this at this point, um, I don't know that I can dig back and ex, and you know extract my thinking. Um, you know, that probably wasn't like a September conversation or September just you know late August decision. Um, I can think about that and try to get you a little bit more details. No, it's, it's okay. It's just, it's more for future thinking if we're contemplating yeah. other switches that just to be mindful that uh, when the plan changes and it's sort of outside uh, the setting of the school committee or the setting of the public, it was really traumatic for people when it happened. And so I was just, I just think it's something as we look to contemplate future steps. I mean, I don't, I don't think that it's worth going back, but I think it's informative to the future as we contemplate changes, just to be mindful it, that it, you know, very few people have kids only at the middle school and right. sort of how does, how does the schedule change at the middle school, even if it's a good one, ultimately, you know, I think people seem happier with it, but it still was, it is different than what we approved as a committee and it's mm -hmm. different than what the elementary school is doing and different than the high school. So, you know, in terms of overall familial disruption, I just think we have to be mindful of schedule changes aren't really in isolation, even though I think it's working really well at the middle school. It is different. And as you know, full bias, as you know, I have a child at the elementary school and a child at the middle school and lots of friends in the same position and their schedules in full remote are totally different. So that's disruptive to families. I guess that's my high level point. And that was made kind of in a vacuum, even though I think it yielded not a terrible result. Now, I, I know that there was a lot of revisions. Um, you know, once you start rolling something out like this with faculty, with you know, 
with all of the stakeholders, you start seeing different angles of places that what you thought might work doesn't work. Um, and and you, we do need to make those revisions. I'm hoping that we are at a slower pace now than we were in August and September. And you know we can be far more thoughtful and, and clear about any, trans, any changes that we are gonna make moving forward. And if, if I could just jump in and, and reiterate kind of the pattern that we were in at the beginning of the school year, where we had never done this kind of teaching and learning before. So there was this pattern of try, fail, fix, <laughs> and um, trying to get teacher voices in about what was working, trying to survey parents around what was working for them. So we, we know that there, there were changes made. Um, but again, trying to be responsive to the information that we had coming in. Um, so just to, to add to Craig's point. So Craig, are you going to talk about what you're gonna do with the data you collected here and then what's next? That's the plan. Perfect, then I will ask no questions. All right. <laughs> so, you know, looking at, at some next steps, we're looking at schedules and supports. Um, how can we increase our student connections and then the middle school model? So let me, oops, try to advance my slides. So most of our students, when we are in-person hybrid are in school for two days a week. What we've been building over since we opened is our highest need students having them in for four days a week. Um, you know, most of them are, are in a special education program and they're there with special education supports. Um, starting today, actually, we started bringing in um, some additional students on Wednesdays for some in-person support. So we looked at the students who really struggled academically uh, in quarter one, identified a number of those students and invited them to join us uh, on Wednesday to come in, make up work, um, just have a place to work that they can get some supports. Their teachers may or may not be there, um, but the, we do have uh, teaching assistant support and, and other staff support there. So we had, um, a, I wasn't in, in there this morning, but we had a handful of students join us today. Uh, and I suspect we will have more next week. Um, it was a relatively short notice for families this week. Um, we weren't initially gonna do it, but then we, we jumped on it with even with this uh, transition. In the schedule piece, we're looking at um, making some reductions to our transition time. Right now we have about five minutes built in between classes and that amount of time is not necessary in all of those places. Um, and what we're trying to do is harvest some of those minutes and build in uh, structured mass breaks for each grade. Um, we do have, uh, our teachers do have the leeway to take kids outside and take mask breaks at any time. And certainly if students need a mask break, they can ask for one and we can provide that. Uh, but what we're hoping to do is, is build that in so that all students have a, a clear opportunity to take those mask breaks outside of their uh, lunch, break, uh, lunch block. And then um, we, we, we had gotten feedback from a number of parents about where could they learn about what's going on. So we created a uh, MRMS Currents uh, page on our website and we've linked in any of our in-school activities that are happening as well as um, I reached out to uh, some community organizations like the library and the community house um, about any activities that they are doing that mid middle school students might be interested in. I know, um, I think the library was doing a cooking online cooking class that we added in there. Um, so I'm trying to keep that updated. If you, people have, I have things that are going on that our middle school kids might be interested in, shoot me an email, we'll add it right on there. Um, and if people are looking for that, it's right on our uh, front page of our web website. And then this week we um, started doing some pilot enrichment activities. So um, uh, on Tuesday, today and Thursday, um, we have a teacher who is doing some outside of outside activities with kids, some uh, improv games, uh, writing letters of thanks to uh, first responders and, and seen, uh, Christmas cards to seniors or holiday cards to seniors. And we are, um, we're just playing around with some different activities that kids can join in, be social and, and have a little bit of fun. Um, so as we, as we expand that, we'll certainly let people know. Uh, Bringing back more students to in-person learning was a, was a question um, that, is, that I've had numerous times. 
And for us, space is a, is a, is a huge limiting factor. Um, right now, our classrooms, uh, which, you know, if you look at the square footage in our classrooms, they are well, un, well, they're, they're fairly under the uh, recommended sizes of uh, new construction. Um, we can fit 14 desks with six foot distancing. Uh, and that's, that's tight. Um, this picture here shows a science classroom, which has its other challenges of these central sinks. And uh, we are currently using two person tables with one person at each one. So I'm, you can fit 14 in there, but it gets really awkward. Um, so I don't see a model where we fit more than 14 people in a classroom at six feet. Um, if you significantly reduce the social distancing, um, and I haven't laid it out with the actual desks, but this summer I laid out just chairs in a classroom. I could fit uh, 19 or 20 chairs in a classroom at three feet. However, you know, half of those are, those are physically pressed against the walls in the side of the classroom uh, with a very small amount of teaching space. So space is definitely gonna be an issue for us. And then um, our indoor lunch capacity with six feet is 65 students. Um, and, we have, and we currently have three lunches, one per grade. So one of our sixth grade cohorts, for example, is at that 65 mark. So if all of our students are present and they're all eating inside, it's, we are full. Um, so if we are going to bring more students in, we either need to reduce the social distancing or we may need to build in additional lunch blocks, which would reduce learning time and cause other major disruptions. So. I, I just wanted to put that out um, that it's, it's not, a, not an easy fix on that end. Um, May I ask one question, sir? Sure. Do, do the students move or do the teachers move? Students between are moving classes. between classes. Um, so we, we have a, um, we're, we've moved back to using bells, which is, I'll tell you something I hate, um, <laughs> but we, we really needed to synchronize the, uh, the class transitions a lot more. So, you know, the bell rings, we dismiss, the students get up, they wipe their tables and then they're dismissed with half the population and they're based more or less moving to the next classroom or not very far. The hallways are not crowded. Um, and so it's that, that hasn't proven to be an issue. Um, so yes, that in, in a nutshell, the, the students are moving and not the teachers. Yeah, in my in my in my school, I have we move the teachers move and the students are stuck in a chair all day. <sighs> you know that alone is not good for kids either. So no, no there's no good solutions. All right, thank you, sir. Um, so we're working to um, with our technology this year. We've made some some big strides. Um, last year we were already at a tipping point for our one to one needs. We were working out of uh, Chromebook carts. Um, but we had, we were, you know, running into issues with not enough Chromebook carts available for teachers, uh, get transporting them between uh, classes. So uh, this pandemic pushing us over that little precipice to a one-to-one -one model has actually been a good thing, uh, particularly with our students doing so much work from home. Um, I, we had some uh, supply chain delays with the iPads that we received. So um, the elementary principals were very kind in loaning us uh, Chromebooks to get us started this year, which we are in the process of returning now. Um, so I wanna thank them. Uh, we've distributed iPads to all of our, uh, our teachers and provided training on those. And then our seventh and eighth graders received iPads um, a few weeks ago. So, and our sixth graders are using Chromebooks at this time. So the technology piece is, is well in motion. Um, so the question that, that comes up is, can we zoom kids into the classroom when they're not physically there? So on an asynchronous day, can they become part of that classroom? Um, and there are lots of uh, complexities to this. It's not an easy, just set up a camera and point it at the board type of thing. Um, so we're, we're starting to look at this. Um, we've got some teachers who are playing around uh, with this a little bit. I had an English teacher zoom in some students uh, for a, uh, read, a novel read that she was doing. Um, and we're just, just getting into that. Uh, the high school is a few steps ahead of us um, and there's a lot we can learn from them. 
So we're, we're having our departments, uh, you know, our academic departments share their information and we're looking to get our middle school teachers up to the high school while we're physically there to, uh, to learn from their experience and, and share their practice. Um, you know, in the conversations we've had, we've learned that the effectiveness of uh, zooming in is going to vary by department, by lesson, by what's going on. Um, it may be appropriate for some things. It might not be a great fit for others. Um, so as we move through this, we're going to need to determine what our tech needs are. And, um, you know, I, I know the Ed Fund was very gracious in supporting uh, the high school in outfitting um, what they need. And, you know, I'm, I would be looking forward to talking with them about um, what, any support they might be able to give the middle school as well. Uh, there's going to be a big learning curve with this, and it's going to have its benefits and its drawbacks. Um, and it's going to take us some time. You know, this is not something that you're, I, I would expect to see in full force in the next couple of weeks, maybe even in the next couple of months. Um, but I want to see, you know, what we're looking to do is get some teachers trying this, sharing their practice, and, and working to refine it. So some of the potential benefits and drawbacks here are, um, you know, it can help keep students on the same pace, get deeper into the curriculum, um, maintain connections during quarantine um, so that kids who are not able to be there for in-person can connect and not, uh, not miss anything. And, you know, it, it also offers the opportunity to combine our two cohorts, our, our cohorts for a larger group of students um, you know, one of the one of the pieces that came up in the feedback was that by dividing our students into smaller groups, you know, cohort A, cohort B, fully remote, you're really cutting into their social opportunities um, and their opportunities to make new friends and new connections. Um, so, if we can, in certain circumstances, combine them, it would allow for more of those student connections. Um, some of the drawbacks are, are more screen time, which is you know pretty high right now. Um, it's, it's difficult to manage attention uh, between the students who are physically in your room and students who are uh, coming in remotely and, you know, trying, you don't want to be troubleshooting tech issues with the kids who are coming in while you're trying to work with the students in person. So there, there is that piece. Um, it provide, it would reduce the flexibility for um, asynchronous students. You know, one of the benefits of being asynchronous is that you can work at your own pace um, and you're not as tied to a period schedule. Um, and it may not be the right thing for all of our lessons. So there, there is a lot to learn and a lot to do here. So we're, we're looking to do some piloting at the middle school. I, I've had a few teachers express interest in, in playing around with this. Um, we wanna share our collaboration or wanna collaborate with our high school uh, colleagues and their experience and also you know, reach out and look at how other schools are doing this. I'm, I've been talking to other principals and, you know, I, I often hear that, you know, this community is doing it great and this community is doing it great. And when I have the conversations with the principals, there's, you know, you see the, how the sausage is made and it's not all, all you know, wine and roses there. Um, we would need to acquire some technology, uh, probably, you know, high quality cameras, microphones, uh, professional development, as well as finding the right balance. Uh, you know, again, just putting something up there, it does not make it a good practice. It has to be, you know, used and, and will require us to shift how we provide instruction as well. Um, so layered on top of everything we've talked about with the pandemic is, you know, in the spring, the middle school got hit really hard in the budget process. Um, we, we lost our middle school model. We lost several teaching positions, um, which outside of just the teaching piece of that, um, it, was a, it was a pretty big blow to, the, to our community. Um, and it's one that our staff didn't really have a, a, a way or a good way to process. Um, you know, unfortunately I had to make some unpleasant calls from home to tell people about their positions and, and didn't have that opportunity to sit down with them and process with them as well as process with the staff the way that I would have liked to. Um, the, the reduction in teaching positions, uh, you know, shifted us more from a middle school to a junior high model. Um, so we lost our teaching teams, which, let, which eliminated um, common planning time. You know, our teachers still have planning time, but 
they don't have that dedicated team of teachers that knows that team of students really well. Um, and I think if we had had that in place, it would serve us incredibly well in this pandemic. Um, it also reduce, uh, reduces our ability to collaborate on pedagogy and developing consistency in how we're implementing our curriculum. So as well as, you know, without the team structure, we're losing um, small communities. So some of our teachers have had to, a lot of our teachers, I should say, have had to pick up an additional class, um, most of them at another grade level. So for example, you might've had a science teacher who's teaching you know, four sections of seventh grade science now has to teach a section of eighth grade science in addition to that, which, you know, that's another level of learning and anxiety and stress that builds while you're trying to completely redesign and reteach what you do know. Um, the cross grade teaching also really limits our ability to do any sort of grade level events or team based events. Um, you know, we are an intervention and enrichment blocks, which were previously taught um, by the, st the students' teachers, um, are, have been replaced by a study block, which is essentially a supervised study with a staff member who may or may not have any particular relationship with the students that are in that room. So it, while they are there and can provide some level of assistance, they don't know the curriculum, they don't know the students uh, particularly well. So there is a loss there. And then we lost our sixth grade world language uh, program as well. So that, that was a bit of a hit. Um, on top of all of this is just increased teacher stress. Um, you know, one of the comments back there in the, uh, the feedback is, you know, I really mourn the loss of the team structure um, and the support that I get from my colleagues through regular um, meeting times and opportunities to collaborate. So I, I put this out here because it's, it's it is a huge piece that's that's underlying um, the stress that our teachers are feeling, um, and the and, and sort of uh, amplifies the challenges that they are are facing this year. So, any of these decisions that we make have positives, negatives, and and unknown impacts, um, and they're going to affect different students and different families in a different way, um, and. I, there, I don't, there is no one size fits all answer here. So we're, we're trying to look at what's the best answer for the most students we can, we can help. And there's our little minion. So, you know, I, I wanna thank you guys for listening. Um, I wanna thank the, uh, the school committee, the teachers, the parents and our students for all their hard work and, and just the greater Hamilton Wenham community for all of their support and flexibility. It's, this is a trying time and, uh, and I really appreciate everybody's work. Thank you. Can I also thank you, sir, and your, and your whole staff, all the, everyone there. It's, you're, you're navigating an impossible situation, building the plane as you're flying it. So thank you for being in the trenches, taking grenades. Thank you. <laughs> Michelle, I think you muted. Could you stop um, sharing so that we could see oh, each other? Thank you. I can. There you go. Um, there are questions. Um, um, Michelle? Thank you. Um, thanks, Mr. Hubby. Could you just explain further the crew um, approach? And I know you said that it's working well. Do you see that as um, a, a further way to connect with the kids on an emotional social level more? You, just so you just explain it more to me, please. Yeah, what, what we've found through our experiences so far is, you know, there's, there's different levels of engagement with the students. Like we have one teacher who has been meeting their crew outside of school for runs or bike rides. We've got other teachers who are playing games with them and just learning, connecting with them. Um, one of the biggest pieces that's helpful for us is they, in seeing their students every day and getting to know them, see and notice when something is wrong and when those kids are off or if they're, if they're absent for you know, more than one or two days, they can check in with them, they can check in with the families um, and they can bring it to the attention of us and the counselors and we can do a follow-up as well. So this is, this is one of those, you've got a lot of eyes looking at a, at a small groups of kids and we can hopefully see problems 
as they start to arise before they become a larger problem. So every middle school student is involved, it has their own crew? They are, okay, yep. that's great. Good, thank you. Anna? Uh, thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Craig, that was super helpful. I also wanna give you a little bit of a shout out as a middle school parent. Um, you know, the communication coming through feels really good. Like of all the places in the district, I feel like people seem the happiest with the middle school for what it's worth. I mean, so I, I think it's not to disparage any other part of it, but I feel like it seems like the middle school is actually working pretty well. That's my impression of taking, talking to people and hearing from people. Um, so I want to give you and the staff, the middle school specifically some credit on that. Um, I have two questions I wanted to follow up on. The first one, you said 16 students is the max at six feet. What is a normal in-person class size at the middle school? So a normal class would be anywhere between 20 and 24 when we're at full capacity. I will say that our um, enrollment has gone down mm -hmm. this year with people going to private school or homeschooling. Um, okay. So it would, our numbers would be smaller, but um, it would be very rare for us to have a class of 16 kids. Okay, so in terms of the distancing, at what distance would we have to go to to get all the kids back in person four days a week? I have not done that math. Um, I thought about it and I started to move some furniture and I, then I just didn't get that far, but um, we can go to, you know, we can play around with those numbers at some point if, if need be. Um, okay. I would love to know that, that number um, because it kind of seems like the, you know, the two prevailing requests from the community are we want more instruction. And it seems like one way to do that is to bring everyone back in person, but that would require change in the distance or your, you know, the experimentation with the Zoom. The thing that you said that made me write with four question marks and you said, you know, we have to experiment, we have to work with it. And it might be a couple of months to get it, you know, really up to speed, uh, full throttle. I, I guess my gut reaction to that feels like, it seems like, again, forgive me, it seems like other districts are doing these things and have been doing them. I have a hard time hearing we could try it, but we might have to do it. And then it might be a couple more months. And I feel like from the public's perspective, there's maybe if you could expand a little bit on that, because I hear that and I think, well, my gosh, why is it taking us so long to get to the point of doing that? And now we're talking two more months and it feels like, you know, we're not even, if, if that ends up being the only possible solution to get more instructional time, it seems like a couple more months of status quo is, is just, too slow. I guess I just want to hear like, what could we do if we can't bring people back in person, which I, I'm not saying we can, I think that's an open conversation to be had, but how can we accelerate yeah. that process? Is there something to make that faster? Cause two months from now, it's going to be February break and then come back. And how could we speed that up? Right. And that may not be a, like, you know, two months from now we flip a switch and everybody's doing it. What it would more likely be is, we start you doing it, you know, in an English class, and we see that that works, and now the other English teachers are doing it. Uh, and teachers start doing it, um, and we start rolling that out. But you know, we were a little behind the eight ball from our technology end as well. Our our teachers didn't get iPads until mid November, um, so there's there's that piece. They had you know laptops. We could have done something like that, but you know that. So there there's. I don't, I don't have the exact answer here, Anna, and I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure it out. Um, one of the key things that I'm I look, trying to do is work with uh, Eric Tracy and what's going on at the high school, because they've done a few of these steps already. And if we can accelerate some of that work, you know, and look and, and see what they've learned and cut out some of their, uh, their you know, stumbling blocks, then that can move things around along a little quicker. Yeah. I will say when I worked, um, not in education, we would say, you have time, money, and quality. You can only pick two. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and here we've got no money. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, we don't really have the ability to do that. So um, it's going to take time. Yeah. Mary yeah. Beth. Michelle, I was just going to kind of build upon what Craig was saying. And I, I think all of these um, adjustments and iterations, it's not a question of, we won't, we're not doing any of it in, in, no, in February, all of a sudden everything will be launched perfectly. It is week by week and day by day in iteration as 
as we learn and as it flows through the school and, and teachers, even for some teachers, they may have parts of their lesson they can do that way in, in one week and a month later, they may have other parts of their lesson that now makes sense. So it's definitely an evolution and not a, a flip of a switch. Um, the, the other piece that I, I would put out there as a piece of thinking around this challenging question about how do we get more kids back in school for in-person learning and the, the six foot distancing, one of the things to bear in mind around that is that the six foot distancing allows us, if we have positive cases, for the vast majority of students and staff not to be close contacts and not have to quarantine. Once you get under that six feet, if there is somebody in a class that is positive, then the impact of that is that the class then becomes close contact and you look to needing to quarantine. Not to say that that's not, not something at no point we would do, but it, it is a, a factor to consider um, when we go under six feet. Dana, did you have a question? Um, I guess I just wanted to, I know that when, um, Jen Clifford presented, she sort of gave a little bit that they had tested out some, um, you know, in classroom stream, just kind of dived right in and tested it out. And I'm just sort of wondering, like, have you guys been doing that in that kind of way, just diving in and doing some testing, even though I understand that you're going to learn from the high school and their model, but um, yeah, I've, I've purchased a few, um, you know, sort of low cost stands um, for streaming. Um, I think there's a picture of one somewhere in that presentation um, so that teachers can play around with them and, and see what's working and what's not. Um, and you know, so I've had a few teachers grab them. I had a teacher email me today and she said, I took the thing, I'm gonna play or try something with it. And I was like, great, that's what it's there for. Um, you know, part of it is, is just also finding the bandwidth with our teachers. Um, and you know, what I think a few weeks ago was an impossibility is now looking like a, something they're, they're open, they have the capacity to look at and play around with now. Right. And to me, even that, even what you just described, sort of playing around with it is encouraging, right? Testing it out, having a teacher that has an idea, learning from that, there might be, you know, you know, some small part of what they test out might really be a success, even if the whole project isn't necessarily, even if the, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Anna, did you have something else? Yeah, I wanted to um, pick back up on something Mary Beth just said, and also, you know, just sort of express a little bit of support for the idea of trying it. Um, you know, I think the sense I'm getting from a lot of people in the community is this feels like an eternity. And even if it's not perfect, they would rather have some small step. I mean, I think it's the theory of Taylorism where if you make a tiny change in the environment, even a small thing would make people feel better right now. So even if it's a little bit of a mess, right? Like maybe it's hard, it's not perfect. I feel a little bit like we're suffering from some paralysis to just try something different because we know what's not working and people feel frustrated. Um, one question I have for Mary Beth is about the six foot. And I, you know, I, I mentioned this cause I know we've talked about it before but I know in some districts that have gone less than six feet yes, the whole class might be considered close contact but then it actually moves as a group. And so one of the things that I know has been frustrating for parents and teachers alike is that if a small number of kids quarantine then they're sort of isolated and they're in a way almost like a whole nother prep, right? So the teacher has they're in class, they're remote class, and now you have this small number of quarantine. And then it's the same for parents. And I think it was a parent, uh, Leah Ty, you know, a couple of weeks ago talked about, well, what's the plan to support those kids? So if you were less than six feet, you would actually move as a group. You would all be together and then you would all be remote and you'd all be together. And so yes, it might be in the potential that a class goes out, but it would be as a block. And in some ways I've heard people express that is actually favorable. Is that something that is at all a topic of conversation? at the district level? That, that's something that, that, that certainly can happen in that, that setting. Um, families would be quarantined. It's, it's not just the instructional piece. So there is an impact in not only for the students in their education, but also for entire family life. If um, we have large numbers of students that may find themselves in a quarantine situation. 
it's you know it, it's been has been said so many times this evening there there is no perfect answer right it's that balance it's the it, trying to decide between the best of some awful options. <laughs> um, and so that that certainly is something that can be considered. I'm not taking it off the table. It's just another factor to be aware of that may not be intuitive for folks. Yeah, the quarantining is no fun. I have a student who's on his third week because somebody in his house just keeps testing positive. So it's not easy um, for sure. So um, great. Craig, we appreciate your being here with us late doing the surveying and, um, you know, trying to be creative. Um, I think that as we go forward, we would love to, love to, and I'm sure we will hear some updates and some of the things that you've done to change. Okay. So, thank Sounds you. Good. Thank you. And if we could build you a bigger building, we certainly would. Um, <laughs> I know we, I, you know, I joked with Mary Beth, like I personally went to school in modules, modulars because of, of a building issue. And um, she was like, yeah, no, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> we don't have that kind of money, so <laughs> wish we could. So. I suspect we're low on the list for the district. <laughs> yeah. so. Thank you. Thank you. And um, now Michelle, we'll, we can switch over to um, Principal right? Tracy. Yep. And Looks like we'll Ms. here too. You have the team. Ooh, where is that, Eric, in your background? Oh, forbidden yeah, temple in nice. Beijing. Uh, you couldn't see the, once you could see the building, then it's all clear. <laughs> that was my trip to China. Nice. Welcome. Thank you. Quickly share my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. Well, certainly thank you for giving us the opportunity to share with you what's been happening during hybrid learning. We focused specifically on hybrid learning and um, really uh, tried to listen to all of the information we're getting. We've done a number of surveys along the way. The latest survey, the information here is uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, I think the 16th of November, we sent it out till about the 24th or 25th. We did both parents and students. So we got some great data. Um, and we, we seem to collect data every single day when we start to, you know, make shifts, when we shift from remote, all of a sudden you get kind of these new wave of emails and new wave of what ifs, and it makes it a little bit fun, a little bit fascinating, and sometimes a little frustrating, but, um, we're, we're continuing to move forward and grow at the high school. So we're following the same patterns, everybody else, where are we now? How's it going? And what are the next steps? And, um, we're, we're moving ahead fairly rapidly. So right now we have um, about 12% of our students fully remote. So in the hybrid program, we're running about 88%. Um, we had a little quick shift just before Thanksgiving. We had from the end, um, probably about the two weeks leading up to Thanksgiving, we had about 10 families shift their kids uh, quickly to remote until after Thanksgiving, they felt more comfortable about that. And that's the beauty of the way we designed our schedule. Kids can move in and out in a day. So if you let me know on Monday or you need to go remote or you, you know something happened, you can go remote on Tuesday. Um, so the beauty of that is, is kids can really get in um, shift, shift the gears and still be involved in their classes. Um, and in many cases now with their classmates. So we have three different advisory periods each week. We host a cohort A advisory, a cohort B advisory. And then we have a separate advisory on Wednesdays for remote students, kids that are fully remote. So I have an advisory as the principal, I have an advisory of cohort A kids, about a half dozen kids. I have an advisory of cohort B kids, a little over half dozen. And then my remote group is about eight. Um, and we do different activities with them, planned activities each week um, to try and make some connections with them, give them an adult to check in with, also check in with them, figure out if somebody's missing, where they are, what they're up to, um, just really gives us an opportunity to, to make the connections with our students that so we, we learned in the spring that that was kind of our missing piece. And I think everybody, everybody really pushed to say, we need something to make these connections with kids. Um, so Wednesdays is during our hybrid schedule is a day where we have kids in high needs kids. 
<clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to back up a little bit. Wednesdays, we have office hours for all of our kids. So every 30 minutes, different block. We also have kids in um, on IEPs and 504s. And then um, some of our students, high need students are in all five days. So we've been able to use our schedule in multiple ways to service uh, specific kids with high needs or program related kids, specific kids on IEPs. And I should have mentioned even our um, L students are in multiple days so that they can get extra supports and, and receive help where they need it. And then we've also shifted recently with um, after reviewing grades and going through, you know, where kids were at, we reached out to a large number of kids and just said, listen, and families and said, listen, if you want to send your child in Wednesday, we will support them. They can come to the library, meet with us. We'll have five or six or seven adults uh, in the library to work with your kids, to help them to get organized, to figure out where they are, to help them navigate something that they might not know how to navigate. So we're really, um, this is kind of our latest step in, in getting kids in um, who, who really need the most um, connection with, with school right now. <clears throat> So how's it going? It, it, it's interesting. We, we did um, a very similar, it was almost exact, except for some of the wording um, for our kids and our parents. And, and this is uh, the survey was mirrored off of a pretty good survey that was done by, by the Marble Head Schools. And um, this information has been helpful for us. The social emotional is, is a key focus for us right now. We even had a leadership team today. We had that conversation of how do we how are we making those social emotional connections and um, trying to figure that out. And that one's all over the map. When you survey your parents and your students, it really spreads out across the map from you know really managing it well to to not managing it well. And I think that that the um, the key there is that. Um, I, I really focus on the, the kids. They were pretty honest in their responses. And I think that's important for us to take a look at that um, overall group and really uh, dig through that data. It's only, it's less than a week old. So we're, we're going to um, take a look at that coming up. And then looking at things like physical health, um, very similar uh, levels of agreement. And then the same with, same with um, academic growth of, uh, similar level of agreement you know when you look at something like this you have to think about what it represents i guess and i think for me it, it probably represents how people feel about their academics and what they may be getting um it could because it really it was really it's really a wide open question I, you know are, you, are are we concerned with academic growth that we you know working towards academic growth and and it was interesting that they came out so similarly um, from the parent and student perspective, because as I said, the, the surveys were separately delivered. And then continuing, um, support has been important for us, trying to get support for our kids, trying to get them materials, trying to send out information. We've, uh, we spend a lot of time um, putting together kits and books and, you know, even even Chromebooks, when a kid's computer dies, we get them another Chromebook. So we have this, you know, very simple system of pick up and drop off now in our foyer so that we can support them. Uh, we also have a number of programmatic supports in place using all of our counselors, including our RISE program people, our social workers, our adjustment counselors, and our school counselors have really uh, been beneficial for us to be able to reach out to kids, check in with them, and then give them opportunities um, to, to check in, in in whatever issues that they're running into. And, and our guidance people, our school counselors, I should say, really work hard to track down kids and, and make make those um, connections and trying to figure out, even, even if a kid disappears for a couple of days, we start tracking attendance and that gives us an opportunity to reach out to say, hey, Billy hasn't been in for a few days. What's going on? How are things going? Um, so the supports are there. And I, I think even the... Um, the supports from the classroom side, people report the office hours have been helpful, even for remote and for hybrid kids, because they can, anybody can check in with a teacher if they have an issue or a problem. Um, so that's, those, those are some of the things that we have in place that we use to basically on, on a daily basis in, in a lot of cases. And then um, people figured out the schedules now took them, it took a little bit, took probably about a month for people to figure out the differences. I and mean, 
the shifting in and out certainly forces that. But uh, one thing we are getting a lot of is um, a lot of information from kids uh, specifically, but now adults, I started getting more of that this week that when we shift to remote, um, because we shifted late in the weekend last week, we decided to stay with um, our hybrid schedule because our teachers had planned for that. So this week, even though we're in remote, we're using our hybrid schedule and it's been a huge hit. Um, not as many touch points for kids throughout the day, but it, it also gives them a little bit of a break. It gives our teachers some flexibility. Now with an 86 minute block, you can really hybridize your, 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 your classroom. You can meet with your kids for 20 minutes or so, make connections, introduce some materials, give them another 30 minutes or so to uh, go work on that material or put them in zoom rooms or, you know, bring them back in at the end of the class for the last 20 minutes to do check-ins and follow-ups and answer any questions kids may have. So teachers are really figuring out unique ways to use the time periods that we have. Um, and initially I think people said, you know, that 86 minute blocks rough and, you know, we're, we're continuing pushing, trying to say, okay, how can we use it? And some of our, um, Teachers who are streaming have helped us to look at the different ways to use it, um, different ways both in and out of that hybrid mode now. So this week right now, we're, we're in the remote, we're streaming our kids, but um, kids are even emailing me saying, you know, can we please stay with this schedule if we stay remote because this really works for me. And um, it's actually a huge push um, by, our, by our kids, but a, a number of our teachers came to me throughout this week, just to say, you know, this, this was really good. It really works well. It has, um, we have, we have um, good opportunity to be flexible during a, that longer block. And then um, the interesting thing for me was the workload. And this, this goes to a lot of the things that we run up against the workload. You know, the parents were like, yeah, it's appropriate. I think my kid's fine. And then on the student side, you're getting that, that really um, overwhelming, like there's too much work. And, you know, you talk to, <clears throat> different kids in, you know, if we look at them group wise, honors, AP, CP, combinations of those, and we start to break that data out, the information um, tends to lean towards the kids who are in the AP honors classes, really feeling like they get a lot of, a lot of um, work, both outside of the school day and the weekends. And I think that's one of the things that people didn't understand that, you know, like a school day, we're meeting with kids during the school day and there's this expectation for work outside of school and it's no different now, you know, and, and the harder part is trying to trying to meet all the needs um, and get um, into the various levels of the curriculum while um, being in, in and out of these, these different uh, schedules. So interesting data there. And then this is, this is something that um, Brian Manigoni, I think he's here. Yeah, I'm here. You want to talk about this one, Brian? This is your work. Sure. Um, so <clears throat> every week, our student support team, which we call our care team, um, we sit down to discuss how kids are doing, talk about individual students. Uh, but we also look at some school-wide attendance data and also some grade data. And to make some sense of this, uh, we created um, a classification called Academic Jeopardy. And really that um, refers to a student who is at a current or at any time really is getting uh, two or more D's or F's. Um, that's a real thing to consider because um, a student um, who is um, in academic jeopardy um, could at the end of a quarter, perhaps um, not be eligible to participate in athletics or extracurricular activities. Uh, but also if a student did fail uh, two or more classes um, that, that could impact their graduation timeline. So there's, I think, a real effect there. So we, again, we created that classification just to get an idea of um, school-wide um, how kids are doing. And uh, the yellow there uh, really is just and at the end of first quarter last year, um, it was right around, I think, five or so percent of students uh, were in academic jeopardy. That, that doesn't mean that five percent of the kids failed all their classes. It just means that um, they had two or more Ds or Fs. And then we track this year um, across the different weeks how um, how we were doing relative to academic jeopardy, 
And the blue lines there represent students who are hybrid and the red lines, uh, those who are remote. And you can see clearly that the kids who are remote um, you know, were in academic jeopardy more often than the kids in hybrid. Um, and at the end of the quarter, you can see that the hybrid students really were kind of where um, we were at last year, first quarter before this all started. So we definitely have some more work to do with our remote students. Um, you can see that over the course of the quarter, um, the remote students did start to uh, perform a little bit better, uh, but we're gonna wanna pick up the pace on that a little bit. And I think as we sharpen um, our approach to streaming kids into the classroom, but also our outreach to students who are at home, we definitely will see an improvement, but we're, we are gonna have to focus on that moving forward. And then that focus brings us to our latest move with our building leadership team. Uh, this is a statement that was I took out of a um, kind of a position that the building leadership took after discussions about, about increasing instructional time. We looked at toying with the schedule. We looked at trying to spread periods out. We looked at doing opposing um, three-day weeks and tried to figure out where the best time was. Um, and the, the, the building leadership team, which consists of one person from every single department um, and program in the building, and they, they were really given the task to go through data that we collected both during the um, PD day and during the, the um, uh, meetings like curriculum leader meetings and volunteer meetings that we did. Um, and they really felt that if we had the technology to Zoom kids in, it will make the most sense. So when you start to look at the data in the previous slide, those early numbers, those remote kids weren't getting a lot of FaceTime with teachers, even digital FaceTime. Um, and what we've seen is as we've had these discussions and then really tried to figure out our options that um, the live streaming option that has been piloted by uh about a half dozen of our teachers, they've really taken the risk and built their own kind of platform based on their content area needs. They've, they've really driven the point home that this can be done and that we can um, teach, um, not similarly, but more closely to how we would in the classroom. Um, so if, if, if you're looking at, um, you know, someone just using a whiteboard and having a discussion, you can do that now with the technology that we're, we're, we've uh, purchased through an ed fund grant, which I'll talk about in a second, we can um, take that technology and teach both the kids that are in front of us in the classroom and also include the kids that are in the remote setting. So there's a picture on here that just has a computer that is leaning back towards the whiteboard. You can see on top of that larger monitor screen is a, uh, a high definition camera, 1080D camera, and it has um, high def microphones on both sides of it. So it, it allows the teacher to, you know, in this case, this is a math teacher setup. The teacher can work at the whiteboard, working through a problem set. The kids in the classroom are involved. The kids in the remote setting are involved. They can hear and they can see very clearly at about 11 foot width of what the teacher is doing. And the, the larger monitor, we're, we're doing a little bit of a screen share, and that larger monitor en enables the teacher to see their kids and zoom in larger pictures. So our pictures are fairly small this evening, but when you put it on this 24-inch monitor, now you suddenly see those faces that are three feet away from you. And kids learn to use two tools. They learn to use the raise your hand tool so the teacher can immediately see that icon and say, oh, Billy, you have a question. So Billy at home can ask a question. And everybody in the classroom will not, will be able to hear it. Um, so that's that's the direction we've been moving in. And we were recently granted uh, approximately eighty five hundred dollars to purchase setups for each one of our classrooms at the high school from the Ed Fund. We really appreciate their consistent support in that. And they, um, you know, they they were excited. They they you know I, I answered I don't know forty five fifty minutes of questions with them but also um, they were very excited to get this up and running and, and start to do this in the community. And we think this is a, you know, it, it took us a bit to get here, but we think this is a better move than, than, you know, in other school systems, they're just kind of taking a Chromebook and a microphone and 
pointing it at the board and leaving it at that and not allowing those kids to interact. This allows our kids to all interact. And depending on where you turn that camera, you can also have a classroom interaction. And uh, the EdFund grant also gives us these multi-port switches that allow us to reconnect to our smart boards. So we can project in three different places, three different things at one time and involve everybody in the room. So um, this is a huge opportunity for us. The equipment has been ordered and it should be arriving this week. And then we will start. We've, we've already reached out. Um, like I said, we have about a half dozen people that are um, that took the ball and ran with it weeks ago and really set us on the course and, and took the risk. They, they worked out some kinks for us. And then we have this next layer of teachers that have said, I want to go next. You know, and it's with any new technology. We have, we have these waves and we will work with each wave and get to the point of the people that might be a little bit more nervous using that. And, and pull them along and get them in place. What we have noticed as we walked around, even, though, even as I walked around today and yesterday, um, teachers are streaming on their own. They're sitting in a classroom, coming into school on a remote day. They're sitting in a classroom and they're using their computer or whatever else they have in their classroom to, to really help kids. And, um, you know, I have to give kudos to our, to our lead team on, on that. They really did a great job, you know, getting... Um, different systems. And one thing I've, I've, I've learned, and we've all learned that each content area requires a little bit different setup. And each kind of teaching style, you know, pushes that setup in different directions, depending on where teacher comfort levels, you know, lie. You can, you can use these cameras now and turn them off, just turn them 180 degrees and have a full class discussion and project all your remote students on the six by by five by five smart board at the front of the room. So we're learning some, some new ways to use it and, you know, getting staff up and running. It's, like I said, as soon as we get this equipment up, we will get it up and running and that will be a um, huge improvement for us, both in the delivery. And I think, I think this will also allow our teachers to let the stress level down a little bit. You know, they, they come to, they come to work every day wondering if they're doing a good job, like, you know, every day, teaching's isolating teaching is like you're, you're you're focused on your kids and your class and our kids our teachers are are really working hard to design a remote lesson design a cohort lesson for this cohort bring in some extra supports for this kid so i think this now allows us to instead of having a lesson for cohort a on monday a block and the same lesson repeated for cohort b on thursday a block we will now do one lesson on Monday and another lesson on Tuesday, I mean, Thursday, similar to, to how we would. So we would just continue rolling instead of doing the same lesson twice each week. So now we've increased our instructional capacity um, by two. <clears throat> and then there's a lot of push and pull, you know, there's no decision we make that's a good decision for everybody. We know that we understand that and you know the information tells us about that and you know this is a, a pretty interesting uh graph and when i talk to kids they're always like you guys should listen to us we'll tell you what's going on um we do we do collect their information as well but the clear clear the parents want more time on learning at the high school level jumps right out that big blue bar and you know when you look at the student graph on the bottom you know they they want less um screen time. So there, there presents that challenge of how do you reduce that stream, stream screen time, excuse me. And um, I think part of the, the remote piece will be helpful, but it's also kind of the next steps. Like what can you do instructionally as a teacher that doesn't involve a computer screen? What can you do as a, a student outside of that classroom to show what you know? And those are some of the next conversations that we'll be having to, as we, as we add this technology in and start to move forward and then use the data to our advantage. Any questions? Eric, can you um, yep. stop sharing just so? Yep. There you go. Uh, Michelle? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um... Mr. Tracy and Mr. Manigoni for presenting that. Um, you know, working with teenagers, how as independent they are, they are also very vulnerable. Um, and my concern is that there's going to be gaps in everyone's education from kindergarten up to our seniors right now. But through time, you know, those through our 
living experiences and, and our educational experiences, they'll be, those gaps will close. But I'm so concerned with the social emotional piece because we know this age group is so vulnerable. Um, so that's my biggest concern right now is if I know, you know, people are saying that the younger kids should come back and we can go remote with the high schoolers. That would, in my opinion, would be the worst thing we could do for our kids. Because So can you just speak to what you see when the kids are in school? Um, you know, what benefits for the social emotional for them being there? It's huge. It is, um, you know, kids come in smiling. I know they're wearing masks, but you can tell. I mean, some I stand in front of the building as kids walk in and you can feel that energy. You can really feel it. I mean, I, that's where I gain my energy from kids. I always tell people that like the summertime's horrible and nobody's around because I'm kind of like, yeah, just going with the flow. Those kids come back in and you feel that energy in the building. And I think for them, that energy is good too, because they can talk and have a conversation with their friends. They can go to classes and, and, you know, work with kids in, in groups or do debates and some of those things that they're really used to and also get the social piece of it. You know, did you hear about this? Did you know about that? Those are real conversations with kids that are important to them. And I think, you know, supporting that in the hybrid is, is important. It's, it's been um, really strong for our kids when, when they come in emotionally. I think you see them, they feel better about it. The kids that you talk to just anecdotally say, Hey, uh, you know, what, what do you, like? they, they do not like being remote. They really do not like being remote. I think one interesting touch point during the day to illustrate Eric's point is lunchtime. Uh, yeah. When you walk into the cafeteria and as odd as it looks with the desks in there all facing forward, it sounds like it did before this whole thing started. Uh, the kids are happy to see each other. Um, that's a chance that maybe they aren't going to get to connect with others. Um, you know, and Eric and I are in there for an hour and a half every day and it's, um, Lunch duty is not always the most fun thing in the world, but this year it kind of has been because it's a chance to see the kids interacting with each other. In a uh, little slice of what's normal, right? Right, yeah. exactly. And the best part about it, because they're at individual desks, it's the cleanest the place has ever been because they know exactly <laughs> who's sitting there. Yeah, so they're not just going to get up and walk away. They've done a good job this year, but it's, it's great to see them happy in that setting. And they can go outside. They can they can go into that courtyard area where our, our friends group has gotten us, a, I don't know, maybe 50 or 60 chairs. So kids can go out and just chill out and hang out and do what kids do. And I think that's important as, as much as the educational piece is there. So they still have those, those social breaks during the day. And then they know to get back to their academics, you know, and we're learning from their feedback too about the length of periods when we should have mask breaks and, you know, what kids expect from us too. So. Yeah, I'm just I'm just so concerned with the lingering effects that this will have on this, especially the, the 14 through 18 year olds, you know, those that have teenagers or had teenagers, you know what that time frame is like, what that that little bubble is like, and they are so fragile. So thank you for, you know, trying to bring a little bit of normal life back to them. So thank you, Peter. Mine was more just to, to back up what Principal Tracy was saying about the longer blocks. I'm a big fan of longer blocks. It really gives the teacher uh, greater flexibility to chunk it up, um, differentiate, use different learning styles. I just wanted to back you up on that. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say over the summer, I took a class with um, the Stanford Online High School and they were like, oh yeah, longer blocks are necessary for remote learning. I was like, oh, Fascinating, I would have thought it was shorter. So, um, Anna. Thanks, Michelle. Um, thank you, principals. Awesome presentation. Uh, really informative, especially to someone like me who doesn't have a high school student. So, um, you know, I don't know the intricacies. So I have a few questions and then, um, you know, a couple of thoughts I wanted to share kind of in the same vein as Michelle Horgan. So I know in the beginning, I got reports from some of the all remote parents who were saying that they had students who had zero synchronous classes at all. And it sounds like that problem has gotten better and will get even more better. But are there still pockets of classes that if you're a full remote student, you never actually have a class with your teacher? There are. Okay. Uh, they're, they're because of the lack of technology. So that's one of the things, the, one of the moves we're making right now is to make sure everybody is has the technology and the ability to do it. So there are, there are, a huge number of teachers that are using every method they can to remote kids in. I mean, I, I even have 
you know, a phys ed teacher who has a special meeting time outside of the day schedule just for his remote kids. So teachers know the value of connecting with those kids. And I think um, in the beginning, we stated right up front, there would be no um, synchronous time if you were fully remote. And, and then we've, we've built on that um, piece of our, our initial plan, if you go back to the initial plan. So I, I, I think right now, like if you go back to the student survey, um, 85% of those kids all report that they have some level of um, connection when they're remote with their teachers and their classes. So it's changed dramatically. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's good. I think the only issue I have is, you know, that equity question, which I'm glad you're addressing, because I think, um, you know, equity between the hybrid kids and then equity versus the remote kids. And I guess, you know, on some basic level, um, I'm a little bit concerned that what we're offering kids depends, it sounds like it depends a little bit on what teacher you have. And if you happen to be one of those lucky kids that gets a teacher who's been really innovative and willing to push it, you've gotten a lot more than a teacher who has done less. And then there might even be still a third tier of people who haven't had it at all. So I just, I know there's no perfect answer tonight, but I will say that that's a concern for me um, in terms of what we're delivering to students feels a little bit inequitable in a structural way. And it's a concern. Um, so I think whatever we can do to try to bridge that gap is huge. Um, I think can I, if I, can I jump in yeah. there for a second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think your concerns hundred percent valid that the word equity has come up in every single one of our conversations, our curriculum leader conversations, our teacher meetings, kids talk about it. Um, and I, I think that's a valid, that's been our push to say, okay, we need to get this technology up and running as quickly as we can. So, yeah. um, we, and, and it's, it's, it's important. We, we, you sh everybody should be aware that our, our teachers work pretty closely together. Best example I'll use only because I trip over them all the time is my geometry teachers. They are, you know, one was leading the pack on remote learning. One was kind of trying it out and one was, I, I'm not there yet, but they were in very similar places only because they continuously click, uh, shared, shared um, assignments, shared planning, um, use the same documents, use the same hyperdocs. So they, they really work together to, to keep as closely as they can. And, and it's no, it's, it doesn't, it's not different than other school years when kids are all in school. There are some teachers that are moving a little bit more quickly. And sometimes we have to rein that in. And that's the job of the curriculum leader to get in there and say, okay, hold on, don't take off too far. We need to, you know, to keep people kind of in sync. Yeah, no, I think that, I mean, it's definitely a concern. I think the survey data is interesting because when parents say they want more time on learning, the way you're facilitating that is with more screen time. So it's almost like to give the parents the thing that they want, you have to do the exact thing that the kids, kids don't, don't want. Right. But I think that's the reality is kids are kids and grownups are grownups. That's how it is. Um, there's two other things I just want to pick up on real quick. Um, Mr. Metagoni, you said something that actually concerned me mm -hmm. and runs counter to what I thought Mary Beth Tate said last week about lunchtime mm -hmm. and the moments when kids are unmasked if they're mm -hmm. indoors. Yeah. Um, because I know that's the point of concern, right? Like mm -hmm. all of our safety and protocol yeah. works because the kids are wearing their masks. Yeah. But when they take their mask off, mm -hmm. totally different animal. Right. So it's interesting that you're saying that lunchtime, quote, sounds about the same and feels mm -hmm. about the same. Because I could have sworn that Mary Beth Tang said there's been an active effort to keep kids quiet and not talking a lot and not mm -hmm. like try to be chill without their masks on. Can yeah. you expand on that a little? Or am yeah. I completely misunderstanding what she said? Because I could have sworn she said they're trying to limit limit talking and like shouting. Yeah, no, there's, yeah. well, there's definitely, it's quieter than it was. First of all, there's only 97 or so kids could we fit in the cafeteria now and maybe about 80 at a time. So the, it's, it's quieter than it normally was. Um, but kids are talking with each other um, during lunchtime, but they're seated the whole time when their mask is off. So we don't have and, kids up walking around. Uh, and how many feet apart other. are they six without feet. their, so yeah. they're six feet there yeah. too without their mask. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's, that's something I wanna think about. Then the only other thing I wanna say, you know, Michelle was sort of talking about the, you know, the time, right? Like this time is crucial for social and emotional. My only thought, um, and this is, you know, we're not gonna again solve it tonight, but I do wanna pose the question to our committee of, when are we going to take a vote and make some directional changes on a high level? Um, and the reason I say that is that as much as that emotional part is huge, 
you know, high school kids can build emotional connections outside of school in a way that younger kids can't. And I sort of think about these foundational literacy skills that we talk about. Little kids right now, you, this is when you learn how to read, right? And those kids at the elementary level that are missing it are, it's like missing the crucial buildup to the next level. Whereas high school kids, because they went to elementary school not in a pandemic, they built those foundational skills. So if we're looking at sort of like, we get to the point where we have competing interests around time and space, I sort of look at it saying, well, the high school kids benefited from being in elementary in a non-COVID world. They know how to read. They know how to use technology. They have other skills. It, it almost feels like we're setting our elementary kids up to trying to play big league baseball without ever having swung a bat, you know, like to ask them to move forward. And so I don't want to get into a big debate about it now, but I just want to raise that as much as I hear the anguish in Michelle's voice and the voices of high school parents that high school kids have a natural advantage already because they know how to read, because they learned how to read. Whereas, you know, the K through three, K through four kids are struggling in a very different way. So I want to go back to something that somebody said where we can't necessarily have a one size fits all because our high school kids need something different than our elementary kids need right now. And that's okay. So I just, I guess I want to pose the question to the committee is at some point, I think we, the committee have to offer some direction about what does the district prioritize and how are we going to make changes and what are those going to look like? And I'm really curious to know, because I don't see that as part of the agenda for tonight or you know, the next meetings. But I think that's the question in everyone's mind is when are we going to make some decisions about how we're going to shape change things? And what's it going to look like across the district, not just the high school changing and then the middle school changing and the elementary, like it has to be a district level conversation. So that's all I have is thank you guys. It was a great presentation. Um, I just want to point out that when Mary Beth was discussing about lunch, she is not the high school nurse. She is the middle school nurse. So that's her experience at the middle school. So, um, okay. Dana, you had your hand up a second ago. Correct. Um, yeah, I guess I, this, uh, I, I just wanted to sort of emphasize that what I was talking about, I really heard in your presentation, this idea of um, testing things out and moving towards change. And I am really, that presentation was very helpful to hear the number of ways that you have already and are continuing to adapt and change. Um, because I think that is very much what is needed and it, it gives me a lot of hope um, that, I mean, even that idea of that, you know, I would not have predicted that about the hybrid schedule. And I love that you listened to the feedback and you, so I just want to say, I feel like that is something that I hope our district parents can hear. And also to know that change is always difficult and uncertainty is always difficult. And I, I hear that from parents that it's hard when things change and I and I also know that there's so much value in being flexible and not being rigid and so I, anyway I applaud you for being able even in the face of always it's challenging to make changes but I applaud you for being able to um, move forward when you see that something is a potential improvement so yeah. thank you and you know I voted for in person. I'm, I'm, I'm just as annoyed as all the other people that my student is at home um, and only went to school two, week, two days in the month of November, but I believe we are making the right decisions and I, I really look forward to when this is over. Um, and I um, am grateful that, you know, he gets to go when he gets to go. So <laughs> thank you. Um, all right, so I guess we'll be hearing back from you sometime in the future about yep. um, how things are going. So sure. thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. All right, so the next thing on our list is um, <laughs> the warrant for the school committee um, nominations. So you may recall last year, there was some um, disagreement about holding the school uh, committee elections. The regional agreement says that we can call them in May, or they can be held uh, with the town. So as it turns out this year, those two things happen in the same month. 
Um, so we would like to sort of approve this warrant um, to be at the same time in May as, as the towns and then send that to the towns to let them know we would like to do it at the same time to save them money so that they don't have to hold two elections. So um, that is what's before us. Um, is there any questions about that? All right, then I guess, Dana, you can just sure. move. <laughs> uh, I move that uh, the Hamilton Wenham Regional School Committee approve the uh, warrant uh, as presented on the exhibit, on the agenda. Super. Is there a second for that? I'll second that. Yeah. And did anybody want to discuss it? I, I just had a quick question. Yep. Nomination papers, if, if you're a serving member of the school committee, do you still need nomination papers? You Not don't, currently. but Julia will. <laughs> yeah, but Julia will, yeah. If she okay. tends to run again, Julia will because she's not been elected before. Yep. I see, okay. Yep. Um, all right, great. So um, we'll go to the roll call vote. Stick with the backwards alphabetical, Peter. <laughs> yes. Uh, Anna? Yes. David? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Dana? Yes. Michelle Bailey, yes. That's a six in the affirmative. Um, next, we have the revised 2001-2002 uh, school calendar. Um, what is revised? 21-22. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, what is revised is that we... Um, updated the way we list religious holidays and that um, Good Friday is not a holiday, it's a vacation day. And that um, Juneteenth would fall on a Saturday or on a Sunday. So that would be observed on a Monday. Um, as it currently stands, the students would get out of school before then. Um, so that holiday would be recognized by our staff um, in the central office. So basically we're trading the holiday, which um, is in April for the holiday, which will happen in June. So it's um, cost neutral or, you know, time worked neutral. <laughs> Do you want to make a motion, Dana, and then we can discuss it? Uh, sure. Uh, I move that the Hamilton Wenham Regional School Committee approve the uh, um, changes to the approved 2021-2022 school calendar as attached to the agenda. Yep. Um, so I'm just going to start off the discussions here. I, you don't have a second yet. No. Oh. I'll second to get the discussion going. Great, David. Um, so just to let you all know. I did send you an email from our um, teachers union who um, expressed some concern about the early start. Um, however, we also have done the, this was our plan before, <laughs> for this year before um, life took a little turn here. So, um, and it all has to do with when Labor Day starts, so. Um, but you all have been in receipt of that information. Uh, what, uh, starting that er that early always had to do with um, factoring in snow days. There's never going to be a snow day again in public education. Well, people have if, said if that there's that one thing that not, came out of that you is, know, I can actually add to that a little bit. Um, the commissioner has has been clear that he is granting a one year um, kind of reprieve from snow days. But in our conversations with him, he has repeatedly said that he is not anticipating that um, we would be offered the same ability to teach remotely on a snow day moving forward. Um, so that, that was something that actually we had thought may be a possibility, but um, in, in communications with the commissioner, he's been pretty clear that that will not continue. He even said that in a commissioner update, like he was like, mm -mm. 
So yeah, so that's... I mean, th th that'll change, right? I mean, th there'll be so much pushback. Snow days are, re he'll change his mind. <laughs> we had, they had the blizzard bags for three years and then they stopped it. So I don't think we can count on something changing. And if it does change, then great, we can change, but we can't depend upon that. Anna? So I have two questions. Um, I want you to unpack a little bit the Good Friday designation as vacation and not holiday. Um, I mean, part of me likes the fact that we're not giving a holiday to one religion over another, but I also feel like it's, you know, <laughs> a little bit potato, potato. I mean, we're, we're voluntarily giving a vacation day where we know that there previously was a holiday. It feels a little bit like a, a shifting of the goalposts. And I'm just curious to know the rationale behind that, it, I mean, it, it, it just feels like you changed the letter on the top of it, but you didn't actually change the intent of it, which is we're still giving Good Friday as a day off for no particular reason other than we're arbitrarily adding a vacation day to the front, the back end of, I would love to hear this sort of rationalization because it feels like you're just changing the letter to skirt a potential discriminatory issue, but the net effect of it is the same. So that's my first question. Not to skirt a discriminatory issue. It's completely because the state has said that we should have a different holiday. And so that would require us to have given our staff an additional day off. But so, Good Friday you know, was never a holiday. It was it's, an it's, H before. It was an H on the calendar that was presented to us before. It's not a state holiday. On our calendar, it was an H. Therefore, our staff had the day off. Right, and I'm proposing that we just go to school on Good Friday and observe the new Juneteenth holiday, which is a state holiday. Correct. So if you want to do that, I would highly recommend having multiple hearings because when it was changed to have it on Good Friday, there were several public hearings. I would also argue that it's the Friday before spring break and that, or April break as it's called here in New England. And it's a highly absenteeism day anyway. So to change it for that particular year is gonna set us up for the situation which caused us to be in this situation, which was 50% of the high school students being absent and so many teachers being absent that we could not get substitutes. I, I just, I understand the it history. It was a highly educational day. I understand that. But educational day for a non-educational day. I understand that. However, adding a vacation day because it's inconvenient to have people here. Again, I point to the other districts around us. The only other districts that have Good Friday off for either holiday or vacation, call it what you want, potato, potato, it's still a, a day off. The only other district that does that also has parity for Rosh Hashanah. Essex goes to school, Ipswich goes to school, Topsail goes to school. I don't understand why our district is the only district that has trouble getting everyone to show up. And I think it's because we give it the day off because we've given deference historically to a religious holiday over others. I'm simply saying, let's just make it a regular day and it's not a holiday, it's not a vacation day. Like, let's just go to school because Good Friday moves all around. So this year it happens to tie to April vacation, but that's not always gonna be true. So I, I, I just think we're introducing I think we're I think we're adding a caboose to the train that works this year, but isn't going to always work. And the underlying motivation for giving it off still comes from the same prejudicial religious point, which is we're trying to sort of work around the fact that we're giving deference to the Christian set of our community. And I just I disagree with that on a, a really basic level. Dana. Um, so I um, first I have a clarifying question and then I want to address the topic on the table. So my clarifying question is that you said this was net, it was neutral, but we still have a vacation day. There's still one more day off for the staff because there's a vacation day and then there's a holiday. No? No, because staff do not get vacation days off. What? what? 
uh, maybe one of the ways that I could help with that, our staff work 185 days, right? So there's a total of 185 altogether. So if there is a, like if we look at April vacation where you see the V's on the calendar, those V's don't count towards the 180. Oh, I understand. So in other words, basically it's just the day is off, but they shift the day somewhere. Right. Got it. Okay, that answers that question. Okay. Our custodians so, do not work when it's designated a holiday. Yeah. But when it's designated a vacation day, they would. And nope, our that makes sense. office staff, will work on vacation days, but they don't work on holidays. No, that makes sense. That so makes it's sense. a very important distinction. No, thank you, that makes sense. Um, my second point to Anna's point is, I, I guess for me, I'm looking at it a little bit differently though I think Anna and I agree fundamentally on this, but I am looking at it as this calendar before us was already approved with that day off. I'm, me personally, I'm comfortable, I, with, because this calendar had already been approved to leave this calendar with that day off. I, however, agree with Anna, even though I have lived through a lot of the realities of this community's struggles with fr the Good Friday, I agree with Anna that it is problematic um, and that I think in the future, I, beyond this, this is the last calendar that we have that's approved at this moment. I would be hesitant to do this going forward after this approved calendar. Um, and I do think it is going to be a complicated and difficult. I, I did live through the part that you're talking about where we couldn't, we couldn't get enough substitutes to come into the, I mean, it was complicated. So I, it's real, but I, I really do, I think it's worth addressing, so. Um, Michelle, the other thing I wanted to, well, I have one other thing I wanna say that's unrelated to that topic. I'm sorry, I had three very brief things. I'll uh, both Anna and Dana said exactly what I wanted to say. Um, I do think we should start having a serious discussion about this. Um, like for instance, if the logic is the vacation, you know, it's a, it's a day off before a vacation, you know, Rosh Hashanah would fall on September's, um, it falls on, I lost my place, the 6th through the 8th of September we could have the seventh off and create a longer weekend um, if that's the logic. But I do want to, I do think we need to have a, a more in-depth and serious discussion about religious observances. And I'm just wondering on the calendar, it says April 15th is Good Friday and school is in session, but above it, it says April 15th, uh, Good Friday vacation day. I don't. Does it say schools in session on that? Religious observances, schools in session. It says April fifteenth in the center column. Good Friday. Yeah, I think I think I that's thought that was supposed to be not there. So yeah, I think Janelle fine. forgot to take that part off because I think the current one. I'd have to go look at the current one, but we purposely modified that to yeah. make it more inclusive. Um, the last time we looked at this current year's calendar, so. That would be, I think, I think my memory of that is that we would strike the school as in session and just, we're just, the purpose of putting them all together is we're putting all religious observances of any kind in the same spot with equal weight and equal measure. Um, oh, and just remove schools and session. Yeah, just remove yeah. schools and session. It's for, it, right, it was for an awareness so that people are aware these are the religious holidays. Yeah, right. the, teach, the it, teachers it, need to know. The is supposed to inform the staff and the principals of those days. So this is the mechanism for doing that. Mm -hmm. yeah, excellent. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Yeah, the current the current one for this year that we had approved only says religious observances as the heading for that section. It does not say school in session. So I think that's a just a, a an so oversight. We, we make the motion well written template. strike that. Yeah. Okay, um, but I do want to I do want to agree wholeheartedly with both what Anna and Dana both just said. Um. Michelle, the other thing I want to come back to refers to the note we got from the teachers uh, where right now we're starting two weeks before Labor Day. And 
I personally am of the mindset that I would like to see a start after Labor Day, but I know that that's not necessarily favored by all the teachers. But I think I'm not comfortable with that two week before Labor Day start, especially knowing that our teachers have explicitly made clear that they don't want to have it there. So I would, I would actually move that we start the week later as we have always done, which is the week before Labor Day, not the two weeks before Labor Day. And then that would just push it out so that our new 180 would still be only June, you know, 17th, which is not, not late. I mean, I feel like we've been in school much later and then if we had to push out to the following week for the 185, it would be later. But I, I personally think given all that the teachers are doing for us right now and all that the families are doing, I don't see any reason why we have to start two weeks before Labor Day. I would honor their request to shift it to one week before Labor Day. The only reason I could see everyone wanting to go back that early is if we could go back 100%. <laughs> but, you know, just because they're so sick of being out of school. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, you know, as parents know, <laughs> every day after Memorial Day is not have the same educational value as every day before Memorial Day. So you limit the number of days that are torture in June, um, you know, and Anna, because of the Juneteenth, that would, if we had the 165 days, that would push our last day of school to the 27th of June. Only if we had all five snow days. Yeah, which has been very common in the last few years. It last year was a weird one, but it's been very common in the last few years. So, um, you know, and yeah. it would be super weird. It would be super weird if we had one snow day, then what we would have is a, a three day weekend and then we'd have to come back for a half day on a Tuesday. Well, After we can't come weekend, so. I, I think, I mean, I hear your point. We can't control the weather, but I think for me, this is more about um, honoring our teachers and recognizing that, that they've made their voices very clear on this. I also, as a parent personally, for me, and maybe this is my bias, like late August are the glory days of summer to me. Like I don't ever, I never want summer to end. So I, I don't think that's just the teachers that would favor having later in August to actually enjoy the summer, which if this summer was anything like it, I mean, I do think the notion that we're all gonna need a break and that that might be a really good quality time to not be in school. Um, I just, I, I'm, I'm really torn on this because I, I don't like the idea of starting so early, recognizing, yes, it could push us later, but um, two weeks before Labor Day just seems crazy to me. Dana? Um, I, um, well, I don't actually, well, I don't actually disagree about the start date. I want to respect that the start date was not the reason that this calendar was printed, presented before us tonight. Um, and I was not on the committee when the debate was had about that early start date, it was a year ago. Those of you who were on the committee made that decision. Um, and to, from an outside point of view, I, can, I have some concerns about that, but I have to believe that that was a valid and real discussion at that time and that you decided and agreed upon that. And so I'm hesitant to change the start date at this point. I also think if you do that, you'll be changing the graduation date. But I'd have to count the days. I guess all I'm saying is that I trust that those discussions were had at that meeting a year Dana, ago. Dana, I can tell you that two years ago, Mike Harvey and I had the discussion that we knew this fight was coming two years ago, that this Right, but you must have already, I mean, in other words, this calendar was approved and voted on by the school committee. So you so, must have already had this by, fight. I, Dana, I, 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 we said, Dana we I, said, I said We said coming back to school on September 7th is just too late. So then- well, In reality, this year, had we not been in the year that 2021, I mean, 2020 was this year, the start date was also supposed to be very early. It, yeah just didn't happen that way because of COVID. Yeah, actually oh. it would have been the, a day earlier. It would have been September, it would have been August 24th. Now we're scheduled for next year on August 25th. So I guess, Dana, I like, I like your thinking that you don't wanna necessarily undo things that have happened before, but I actually don't see this as an undoing. I see it as a correcting. Like I think that they, 
approved a calendar that had this religious holiday that really shouldn't have been observed. And to me, the biggest thing that happened between the last time this was voted on, which looks like it was December 18th. Oh, it was my birthday last year. Fantastic. You know what has happened? Is COVID happened since they looked at it? And I think now the mindset that summer is going to mean something different and we're going to be in a different mindset. Like I'm actually okay saying we have new information and that new information is the horrific reality that this year has been. And if starting a week later, which puts our start date to September 1st, like to me, there's a lot of karma there. Just start on the first, it honors the teachers. It gives everyone a pause. It pushes us out. I mean, I, I hear what you're saying about not changing a prior vote in some ways, but I also think the world has actually changed. So I'm okay with it. I would disagree that we've heard from the teachers. We have heard from the president of the teachers association. Who represents I don't the teachers? Know if there was a poll taken mm -hmm. or if it was just an generic opinion. I don't know the answer to that question. I forwarded to you what I had. It was signed by the president of the HWEA, so. But I don't know if that person had taken a poll or a pulse or a temperature or. But isn't, that, that, isn't that his job to represent the teachers? I mean, well, this gets back to the question I posed earlier this week, which is, could we ask the teachers what they thought? And you answered that we couldn't survey the teachers, which I respect because we work through John, their representative. So John has made their position very clear as their representative, I and mean, that's what he does. We had a motion and we had a second, so I think we should vote. Um, Peter? Oh, wait, oh, hold on. Yep. Um, I think we wait, needed with to the amend amendment of striking the oh. school. Do you want me to amend that? Um, I think that Mary Beth can, don't say as presented, say <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe start over. Okay. Well, Could we call it a scripter's error? Yeah, it's a Scribner's error because okay. we knew what it was supposed to be. So let's you said, you said Mary Beth, but I think you mean you just mean Mahala can cross. Is that what you no, mean? I'm no, I'm Mary Beth. Well, Mary I will speak to Jeanette when we get there. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So let's call it a Scribner's error and we'll just fix it. So, Peter. So we are voting to keep this calendar. The days. That we're just making that change to. The designation of Good Friday is the only difference, and the addition of the Juneteenth June holiday. Yeah, the June, Juneteenth. Yeah, the only difference from the one that we voted before. Yes. And then late, then we'll start another discussion about what a calendar should look like in the future. Yes, you'll notice we're only voting on one year. Exactly. Okay. Generally, Excellent. this time of year we would vote on two, but you'll notice we're only voting on one. Right. Okay. Yes. Uh, Anna. No. David? Yes. Michelle? Uh, yes. Uh, Dana? Yes. Michelle Bailey? Yes. That's six yes. Uh, All right. No, Anna voted. Five. No. It's five yes. Oh, Anna. sorry. Sorry. Five. Five <laughs> yes. I voted no. Sorry. 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 Thank you for correcting me. Um, okay. The next thing on our agenda is to review the school committee protocols. So um, we put them here so that we could um, just quickly read through them and just. Um, it, you know, I'll, I'll take over. We, just, and we also thought we were gonna have a new member but we couldn't get sworn in so go right. for it. <laughs> I, think, I think just, um, we had a really productive meeting um, on the 18th. Um, and I'm hoping it was because, among other things, but also we had just reviewed our protocols. So I think just as a committee, it's always good with everything in life, just to take a look at it once a week, once every two weeks, just to keep it in mind, we're in a very stressful situation right now. Everybody is in the whole world, but it's good for us just to keep that in the back pocket, just, okay, here's what, here's what I'm charged with doing, or here are my protocols. Just keep it in the front of your um, back pocket and always just view it whenever you have nothing else to do. Right, that's never going to happen. But just we did it. We had a great meeting, like I said, two weeks ago. We've turned a corner, and I think we're we're um, we're making great strides. So keep on keeping on. Um. So 
finance and operations. That Actually, Michelle, can I can I ask a question or say something about the protocols? Yeah. Yeah. So I agree with Michelle Horgan that I think our last few meetings have been better, including this one. Um, but I I will I will say something that has been frustrating me, and it speaks to the idea about. Um, you know, being prepared and giving equal weight to committee members. And uh, I just want to draw everyone's attention. There are two things that have been happening that for me have been really frustrating where to me, the protocols are not just in the meeting. It actually applies to our overall conduct onto ourselves. And um, I was very pleased today to see that the agenda for the public hearing has finally been posted for December 9th. I'm elated to see that, but it was incredibly frustrating to me that I sent five emails to the two Michelles and Ms. Mary Beth Banos, and not a single one of them was ever actually replied to until the fourth email and Mary Beth did reply to it. So on some level, when we talk about respect for equal members and respect for their voices and listening and all that, I think it's great if we do it in the meeting, but that's an instance where I sent five emails and neither of the two Michelle chairs to date have ever actually responded to the emails and yet we're told repeatedly to email the chairs, email the chairs, that's how we do communication. So I just want to point like, that's been a source of frustration. And there are other emails that I've sent and asked for information and the delay in getting a response is, is frustrating to me. And that's a sign of disrespect. And then at the very beginning of this meeting, um, I intervened, but you and Peter were talking again about an email you sent to him and the learning management system. And he was saying, well, but what about this? And what about that? So yes, the meetings themselves, I think have been better. And I think that's a credit to all of us, but I do want to point out, I, I think we still have some protocol issues around email and timeliness and communication. So if we could extend our good behavior to outside of the meeting, I think that would actually make the meetings better as well. Yeah, thank you, Anna. I, I hear what you're saying. Um, and regarding your email about the agenda um, for the public hearing, um, I just want to voice what Mary Beth had said, that a timely manner. Um, it wasn't that you were being ignored. It was the agendas for the meetings that are upcoming are the priority. Um, we had set a date for the 9th of December, and we were not going to start looking at the agenda until it was an appropriate time. And I know that's not a good enough answer for you because you did take the time and energy to put your thoughts into an email and you wanted responses well, from us. I, I put my thoughts into an email. I was requested after we voted on the 21st. I think you specifically said, please email with your agenda suggestions. Mm -hmm. My first email was on October 23rd. I got no response. It came up at the meeting on November 10th. It wasn't part of the original agenda. I added that date. In that meeting, Michelle Bailey said, oh, did you email me with agenda items? And I said, yes, I did, weeks ago. I got no response. I emailed again on November 15th. I got no response. I emailed again on November 20th. I got a response from Mary Beth say, we'll get back to you after we meet. I did not hear back from anyone. So then I emailed again on November 30th, which finally got us to the point of having an agenda. So at some point in that process, if any one of my fellow board members sent me five unanswered emails, at a very minimum, I would say, hey, Anna, thanks so much for your ongoing attentiveness. We plan to discuss this here. But instead, I literally got no reply of any kind. And that's just, that's rude and frustrating. And then frankly, to have the agenda for the hearing posted with one week's notice when it's been on the table for literally months now, feels really frustrating. And then I want to acknowledge that, you know, Peter has been talking, the question of this learning management system, my golly, is amazing. And he and Michelle started this meeting by discussing what was going on via email. And I just, I'm just saying, I think we've got some work to do. And, uh, you know, I would never blow off an email that I got from any one of you five times in a row on something as important as a public hearing. So I just, I wanted to put that on the record because it's been frustrating and I want to respect the protocols, but they need to be respected back. Okay, thank you. Duly oh. noted, Anna. And, and, and I will as, as promise a, that I will not. Oh, can I? I'm sorry, David, I just finished. I promise, Anna, that when you send an email and I, you will get a response. Um, and regarding Peter, um, you know, we're working with him um, regarding the learning management system. Um, so we will work with him. So. That's it. David, do you have something to say? Oh, two things, or three things now. Uh, one, when a member of the public makes a request for information 
you know, we're, we're required to actually get back to them by in 10 days, right? And so the fact that, no, you know, we have those requirements for members of the public and those aren't even uh, followed for members of our own committee is definitely troubling. Um, you know, I think of another thing that happens is, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot of um, discussion that goes back and forth that tries to do a personal discussion when the protocols of this committee and most committees is that everyone has a chance to actually speak before someone speaks for a second time, right? So that's something that's actually often ignored. And, you know, as far as Peter goes, the, you know, the working with them, what are you working with? You know, what, at what, at what capacity do you have to work with other than adding his stuff to an agenda so he could speak to it as a full committee or, you know, it moves to, you know, either Tom or, you know, Mary Beth where I, or Vinny even, where I sort of think the discussion should go. Um, but the, what, I don't understand what the chair and the vice chair have to work with other than it gets added to the agenda because it's a conversation for the entire committee if it's not put into an administrator's hands directly. I think, David, the purpose or the intent behind asking Peter what he was looking for from a learning management system was to streamline the request. So then when it did come to the agenda, it would be concise. Um, and not be um, more of a more of a theory, but just something that's concise. So then, as a committee, we can make a decision whether or not this is something that we could act upon or charge one of our um, administrators with that task. In the five years I've been on this board, I've never seen requests get pushed back for agenda notes, as was asked of Anna for the. Uh, voted on the committee voted on public forum meeting or to further do to do further research and bring it back to the table as was asked of peter well, at, about researching a, uh, misunderstood the email we did not ask him to do research we asked him to come talk to us about some questions this is why i brought it up at the beginning because when I said, no, Peter, we just need to talk to you. He's, he, he believes that he has to do research. He does not, we just had some questions we wanted to talk to him about. But the top, the, the conversation is to happen in the meeting. It's your job to put it on the agenda to ask him the questions. To, I don't know what to put on the agenda right now. So what whether or not it's not viable, I don't, I, you could ask probably one of, I could go pick, walk into the street and pick someone and they could probably tell you what Peter's been wondering about, about right. whether or not it makes sense for a Hamilton one to have its own uh, <laughs> um, uh, management system, uh, educational management system. Okay. You know, like so, to, to say that you don't, I mean, it, it, this I, is getting kicked down, kicked down the road and it's sort of, it, you know, so, being played out a little bit. So can I say thank you, David and Anna, that we take note and we will not do that again. What, what seems to have been mismanagement and not being cooperative. I apologize for that. In terms of Peter, I will say for five years though, it hasn't been put on the agenda. So now we're trying to help Peter get on the agenda, correct? So I-, I, I, I But I don't believe you because you would have put it on the agenda two months ago when he first brought it up. But why so five years they, prior they, wasn't they put on the agenda? For three years, we're trying to move it because we're talking about it. We're trying to move it. I'll, I'll just interject. I think this is a great this is a great conversation to pick up at our workshop again. Because it's having allegations and it's causing arguments. Our goal here is to remind each other to do better. So we've heard that. Some of the things that have been said are false which is fine. We're not going to talk about those things. So let's just move on. No, I think you threw something on the table there saying that people are saying false things. I don't think that's something that you brought up. Anna said that no one responded to her. I spoke to her on the on Monday morning at 10 o'clock or 10.15, no, at 10 o'clock. And I 
had told her what we were working on with the agenda and we had a discussion at that time. So to say that I did not respond is not true. But this, I did not this respond brought up back in that. October. This was also brought up back in October. So, and you know, it's been we six plan weeks. the agendas one week in advance. So this meeting was on the on scheduled for this day. So we started planning it, which is why I called her. Actually, so Michelle, if, you, if you're going to go down this path, we talked about something else. And uh, what we talked about was the calendar, right? We talked about what's going on with the calendar. We did not talk about this. Either way, I sent five emails and no one's responded. However, in the interest of moving forward, I think this is a great conversation for future workshop and protocol because we clearly have things to work on. I know that there's a lot of people at the public that want to hear the superintendent's update to talk about the metrics. There's more to come. But since this was on here, it just it needed to be said that we have work to do and it has to be a two way street. Right. And thank you. I heard you and the chairs will do better. So thank you. Peter. I just wanted to say this, this is the email that I received that is causing a lot of confusion on a t at two o'clock on a Saturday, I was asked if we could talk about this, talk about this, my request two o'clock on a Saturday. Um, John it says to help us understand more completely your request. Could you please share all information on the following? What is a learning management system? Does the Hamilton Wyndham Regional School District have a learning management system in place? If so, what are the pros and cons of the system from your perspective? Does this learning management system fit into the school community's current work plan? Do any neighboring districts employ a learning management system? I just, I just, I thought that was a lot of research to ask for me on a two, on a two o'clock on a Saturday for a, so, so that's why I've been working on getting you all of this information because I, I thought that was the bar. I, that's what I stood understood the bar to and be. And what was my response to that? Well, that was your email, wasn't it? Didn't that email come from you? And Peter said, do I have to, I can't get this ready because I, I have to do all the research. And what was my response to you? I you're said, we're, we're no, trying don't to need all the research, we just need to talk. It says, we are trying to figure out what the agenda item is about exactly. Right. No, we don't need all of the answers to that. We need to, we're trying to figure it out. So let's just talk, but we haven't heard from you since. Well, I was doing research. Well, there's a, there's a misunderstanding. <laughs> it, it, it seems, it, it seems like very specific questions. On the agenda. It seemed like very, uh, very specific if put, questions. David, if I put LMS on the agenda, what are we going to talk about? Who's going to talk? What, what, what's the, what's the exhibit going to look like? What, well, this, this is why, you know, what I want is that a learning management expert who's volunteered his, his time, he's an international and national expert on this. He could answer all of these questions for us. So super. And it would start the conversation to see, is this something we want to pursue as a district and as a school committee? Wow, this opened my eyes. Great. So Let's pursue it or no, this won't work for our district. Great. So could you meet with Michelle and I so we can figure out how much time that would take and what sort of information we need to get together? That's what we're asking for. Can I, I'm not sure, I, can I put in a request that we move along, but come back to this as part of our workshop because we have other things to discuss. I think the high level problem is, I think everyone in the public can painfully see, is there is a disagreement about how things are still added to the agenda and some members feel like the chairs are controlling about the timeliness and there's disagreement. And I think we can all see that, but I'm, I am respectfully asking that we move on because I don't know that we're gonna resolve it. and. It, in the interest of getting to the rest of the agenda for the public, I say we come back to this. We've noted that there are problems and I think we have to keep working on it. But is, can, I make, can I make a motion to move on? Is that a thing that can happen here? Can we, can we keep going? No, we're ready. We were ready to move on earlier, so that's fine. So it says finance and operations, but there's nothing under it. Are, did Tom and Vinny have something they were gonna talk about? No, we just had it just so people knew the format. Okay, 
Uh, so me, chairs report. Okay, so I have three things. Um, because we are having the forum next week, that was originally scheduled to be a joint meeting with the towns on our preliminary calendar. So that has had to move and that will be on the 17th at seven, I think we confirmed. And uh, so there'll be two meetings that week. Um, the next thing is at our last meeting, um, there was a discrepancy between the time that was posted on the district calendar and the time that was posted on our uh, posted agenda. Um, mostly because we had moved that time and the same issue with the calendar, the template wasn't updated. Uh, when I saw that it was wrong, I had notified Mary Beth and the one was changed, but not the other. So because of that, um, we have posted the first, um, is it just the first hour or the whole thing, Mary Beth? The recording? Yeah. Yeah, we'll put the whole, whole thing. Recording. Yeah. yeah, so the whole recording is online so that if anyone in the public wanted to view it, it's completely there. There's no, there was no, it was an administrative error. There was no like intent to hide anything. It's completely there for you to see the deliberations. Um, and then the last thing is um, I had brought up to Mary Beth earlier that we normally have a student rep and they, um, Mary Beth and Eric were trying to do some different things with that, but um, there's just too much different this year. <laughs> so <laughs> we're gonna have um, Ethan Howell start to join us in our meetings, um, hopefully at the next meeting. So that's it. Okay. Ethan to, to add to that a little bit, Michelle, Ethan will come with a three to five minute update from the, the student body for each meeting. Super. You're up. Great. Um, so I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the really challenging decision that we were faced with over the weekend. Um, clearly, we hear how hard this is for families. That is absolutely understandable. It is frustrating. Um, and, and I want to assure families that the decision was not made without understanding the impact. Um, and we know how hard people are working. We know how frustrating it is. And I, I want to, first of all, be sure to acknowledge that. That's an important piece. Um, one of the things that I think felt frustrating to people is why did this happen? And why did we get this information on a Saturday afternoon? What did we know in advance? So we had met as a COVID response team right before the Thanksgiving break. Um, we went through the metrics, the COVID cases were rising, um, but for all the reasons that, that people indicated, we did not feel that, that, that the levels were at a place that caused significant concern. There was not evidence of transmission in schools. Um, our systems were all working well. Um, and so we communicated to the community that we were staying in hybrid, which was the full intent. Um, over the Thanksgiving break, we got a call from our public health officials asking for an emergency meeting. Um, so we scheduled that meeting for Saturday and they presented data that was escalating rapidly. Um, and not only did we have cases that were escalating rapidly, what was also happening with that is that these cases were overwhelming the system, both at the state level in terms of getting testing turned around, our public health nurses trying to chase things down, our school nurses. And after a, a two hours of deliberation, and this was not one of those things where everybody ended the conversation and said, this is, this is a really good decision. We were ambivalent, it was difficult. We could argue both sides of it. Um, and I, I also wanna say that the COVID management team is an advisory body to the superintendent. And I take full and total responsibility for the decision. Um, I believe that the people on that team are professional. I believe that they, um, there's a lot of expertise on that team and that that people on that team are thoughtful and mindful of the enormity of the decision 
in the recommendation at hand. Um, but I, I do wanna tell the community and I wanna be really clear about this. The committee has tasked me ultimately with that decision and the COVID management team is an advisory body. Um, and I, I will take complete and total ownership of that decision. Um, one of the things that I hear from people in communications around testing, there seem to be, um, in, uh, in the way that I worded it, that people read that, um, that we, one of the reasons that we shifted to remote is that we were waiting for families who had traveled to give them more time to get their testing back. Um, I think we all understand that if a family makes a decision to travel during this time, then they, they have a responsibility to wait and, and get that testing. And we had evidence that a lot of families were doing that. The situation with the testing, um, the bigger concern was related to the fact that public health nurses couldn't get testing back. So a, a, a ramification of that is that if you have a household where you have somebody, uh, say a spouse who is identified as a close contact um, and they're waiting for testing results, the close family members are not considered um, to be close contacts, right? So you, you don't have updated quick information as to whether or not um, there is um, a potential for COVID transmission. Um, the, the staffing issue becomes a problem if you have people that you are anticipating, our, our staff that did travel were really responsible. They gave us the date that they were gonna go for the testing. Um, but at the time that that occurred, testing was turning around in a day or two. Um, over the weekend, the, the information we had is that testing results were taking five to seven days to come back, which means staff that we anticipated would be out for a day could easily be out for the week. Um, and again, you know, that combined with the, the rapidly escalating rates in the community um, and the concern across the board around travel for Thanksgiving um, led to a difficult decision um, and a, a difficult recommendation that at this time, we went in and it was very clear that it would be one week that we were not shifting fully to remote, but we had a system that was under a ton of pressure. Our folks were struggling to keep up with the volume and that we felt that there needed to be some level of response. And so the, the balanced response was that we take one week um, to get things settled down and reevaluate. And I appreciate, as, as again, we've said many times in this meeting, that there is no decision that we can make in this environment that will meet the needs of everyone. And as your superintendent, I, I truly wish that wasn't the case because I, I feel a lot of responsibility to our students, our families, to this committee to make good decisions for this community. Um, and there are decisions and dilemmas in front of us that there, there's no good decision. Um, and what I can say to you is and communicate to you the level of earnestness, the level of thoughtfulness, all the different data that was considered. Um, we put forth and the, the COVID response team put forth the best possible re recommendation we, we had. And that is not dismissive of, I believe all of our beliefs that kids need to be in school and we want them in school. Um, there, there is nothing worse for me when I've said, look at, I am really looking to ensure that there's some predictability and then an emergency meeting needs to be called. And that's, that's difficult because I know the impact that has on families. So I, I, I you know, those are some thoughts and some further details about how this decision processed. Um, we are meeting again tomorrow to look at where we are with things. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy to take any questions from the committee, but I, I think it's important to, to frame this and to, again, assure our community that we are, we are thinking about all families. These decisions are heavy and difficult and there, there's no right response. <laughs> 
Um, and I don't know, Dana, as school committee liaison, did you want to jump in and offer any additional thoughts? Um, before you start, started talking, I thought I have lots of notes, but I really think you covered that was well said. Um, I will just reiterate that every person on the COVID response team said how much they believe that children need to be in school. Everyone said that. Everyone is working towards that goal. Um, I guess the only other thing I wanted to really add is that the tone and tenor of our public health officials at this COVID response meeting was strikingly different than it has been at every other COVID response uh, team meeting. Um, they, you know, I put a lot of trust in them and they were really expressing that things really are, they had a number of areas of concern and they were feeling, um, you know, t torn certainly about making such a difficult recommendation, but they really felt, um, which is why I actually think we may have gotten the email that we needed to meet. It might've been on Thanksgiving that we got the email. Um, um, so, um, yeah, I think it was, I think you said it perfectly, Mary Beth. So I'm happy. I'm also happy to answer any questions if other people, um, I guess my one last thing is I really do want to say I am incredibly appreciative. And I mean that genuinely of all the people who have written emails with their hard, real stories. And I, they are hard to read. Um, but I genuinely, they are important and I appreciate getting them, even though I know that they are directed and at, you know, feeling that this decision was not the decision that they wanted. Um, but I think it's important. And I think I encourage people to continue to give us feedback. And, and I, um, so I will say that. I know. And Dana, thank you very much. Cause you do send um, summaries to us after those meetings. So we're aware of, you know, just what's going on. Yeah. Anna. Um, I think I want to thank both of you for commenting. Um, I want to pick up on a couple of things that some people said in the public, but also offer my own sort of interpretation of what, what happened and why it's been so frustrating and sort of put in a request to, to think differently as that group moves forward. Um, I think the thing that was frustrating was, and I say this as a logistics person, right? Like my brain is always like, here's your plan A, here's your plan B, here's plan C, here's plan D. And I think what was especially frustrating and perhaps as that COVID response team continues to think about future action, the plan A was that we were gonna come back to school. And that was consistent in the messaging. And superintendent, you said repeatedly, school is safe, numbers are low, uh, the transmission's not happening here. And I will be the first to admit, I have actually changed my thinking. I started the entire process thinking that COVID would go like wildfire through the schools. And we're finding that it's not. Even in towns where they've been in the red for a long time, their schools are not shut down. And guess what? they're not spreading COVID like wildfire, which is proof of compliance and that the masks are working. So I've actually changed my feeling about it quite a bit. Um, so I think what's frustrating to the public and to me also is that the message going into it was here's plan A. And then very abruptly we shifted to plan B with no real anticipation it might have happened. And I think what's particularly frustrating is that it was foreseeable and perhaps even predictable that that might've been an outcome. And so it would have been so much more helpful in a, the messaging going into it to say, we really hope that we'll stay in school, but just as a precaution, mentally prepare yourselves, we may have this. And I know that I've heard from parents saying like this rush to get supplies and materials. I know on Sunday, the teachers were rushing to get supplies. That all could have been prevented with saying like, hey, just in case, grab your backpack grab your stuff. You know, we could have been better at planning. And as someone who is a professional logistics person, you always have plan A, plan B, plan C, and they're ready to go. And what's striking to me is that the week now, not only did we reverse course entirely about in school versus out of school, but the plan itself is different. And this gets back to that underlying question that I keep pushing, which parents, especially at the elementary level, thought they were going to stick on 
the two, three hybrid. Um, so, I mean, Principal Tracy described it well. He's like, they stuck with the hybrid schedule, even in remote. And that's what parents thought we were gonna do. And that's what our plan said we were gonna do. And then all of a sudden, a whole bunch of parents got emails from teachers saying, guess what? We're gonna have Zooms four days a week and the schedule's totally different. And now you have all these parents who have built their lives around one schedule with absolutely no notice, shifting to a version of the plan that we had never talked about, we had never voted on. And in some cases that led to actual financial you know, consequences. Like they had hired nannies and babysitters and pod leaders, and now it's all changing. So I guess my, my level of frustration, both as a parent and as a committee member is, we need to be more gentle with our lane changes. It feels like we are helter skelter and when we make decisions and it happened once before and the community was outraged and now it's happened a second time. And what's frustrating to people is all around us, everyone's in the same COVID pandemic. Most towns have higher rates than we do. To my knowledge, no other immediate district has had two district-wide shutdowns on basically no notice. So something about our approach is causing chaos in the system and it's causing frustration from the families. I don't have a perfect answer, but I do know that you have to give people more notice or better communicate plan A is this, plan B is this, plan C is this. Because then when you shift to it, people aren't thrown asunder. And that's the emotional response I think people are offering to us right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll offer you know, a couple of thoughts to that. So I, I do wanna just remind folks that when we, sh we went remote at the high school, that was due to a staffing issue. We were unable to staff the building and we, we found that out at the end of the day um, and we needed to, to make that pivot. That was not related to COVID metrics or testing capacity. That was a pure staffing issue. And I, I have been clear with the community around the fact that that can happen. And that would be a scenario under which there would not be a lot of notice. Um, the, the situation here, um, it, you know, it was interesting right before we went on Thanksgiving break, you know, I was meeting with principals around this, this is a possibility. Where are we in this plan? We had not expected it to occur over Thanksgiving. We have people that are managing remarkable amounts of new scenarios and getting all of them right and all of them perfectly planned um, is a challenge. And so while we have had conversations with our staff around what's working, how, what, getting feedback from our parents from survey, what's working from their perspective, it takes a while to get a plan mapped out with all that that feedback in place. And in this scenario, there was a not enough time between that processing and feedback to when this occurred. Um, and, and so there was not the opportunity yet to say to families, this is what you told us about remote. Um, this is what we've learned from our teachers. And this is the plan now at the elementary school, if that were to happen. Um, and I, I appreciate the frustrations that that causes. Um, we, we know that that is a, an issue. Um, there is a, a, a volume of change and new circumstances that are arising that make the rollout of these things less than perfect. I was on a call today with teachers around, we're not ready if there's a snow day, right? What's the plan if there's a snow day? You know, what happens if somebody lives in a town where there's no electricity and um, in Hamilton Wenham, there is electricity and you're expecting things. What happens to teachers who have kids at home? There are scenario after scenario after scenario of new circumstances that require a lot of thought and planning. And there are times at which we really struggle to keep up with that. And the people in most districts that do this kind of planning and communication would be the curriculum instruction people that are talking about this and then mapping it out and sending it. And I will remind you that all of the positions at the elementary level and the district level were eliminated. And so there are people working really hard to try to keep up with this. Um, we understand the impact. I agree with you, Anna, it is less than perfect. People should have known, should have had a communication in advance saying, here's what could happen. And the reality is in terms of the capacity and the amount of change, 
we at times struggle to do that. But I, I hear you and I, I do not disagree with you that that's an important piece to continue to build out. Um, each time something happens, we learn from it. Um, and, and again, that this scenario was one that we did not anticipate. We did not anticipate. We knew that Thanksgiving was gonna be challenging. Um, we did not expect situations to skyrocket. We did not expect to get an emergency phone call that there was some really significant issues. We did not um, expect testing to go from a one to two day turnaround to a five to seven day turnaround. And so there are things that are happening here that are, are not within our control. And so again, I, I don't disagree that, that in, a, in a perfect situation, that absolutely is the playbook and one that we aspire to. And there are challenges getting there. I hear that. I guess um, oh. I think it's frustrating it's frustrating to feel sort of like the exception when around us, it seems like everyone, it, honestly, it seems like everyone else seems to be managing it better because other districts aren't shutting down the way that we have been. I didn't actually mean the high school shutdown. I meant the first time when we started the year remote and it happened overnight or, you know, within a day, it's just, there's something about our decision-making process that feels very helter skelter to people. And I think that, that is creating a kind of anxiety that does not seem to be present in other districts and other communities. And those other communities are in fact not shutting down. You know, they have higher rates than we do and they're not shutting down. So I just wanna point out like, we are exceptional right now and not in a good way. And whatever we can do to become less exceptional and more normalized. And if we are gonna make these lane changes, even, even just starting Monday, like even saying like Monday, we're gonna start, go grab your stuff, sort it out. I mean, that difference between the chaos of Sunday afternoon to Monday morning or something, yeah, it, it almost feels like there's not enough consideration given to working parents and what that would do to someone with no notice. It, it's just, there's gotta be a better way to do this because we've had two episodes now of a helter-skelter seeming overnight decision, perhaps well-intentioned, I'm not questioning that. I'm looking purely at the evidence, which is our district has made two about faces with no notice and it's caused the community to have an uproar. And we saw it again tonight, you know, I think it was Rachel who commented, there's a group of over 150 parents now, fired up, hopping mad. We have to look internally and say, what are we doing that's causing this response? And for me to hear we're at capacity and it's because we, we cut the curriculum instructor, people are not accepting that. Like, it's just, it's, I, I don't have a solution, but we have to do better. Um, I, I want to make a couple of comments. I, I actually think that um, we definitely should have learned a lesson in the back in August when, or back in September we had to make that sudden shift. I actually think that um, I understand the messaging, right? I, I think everyone has to understand that this is how quickly things are gonna happen. It's going to happen that quickly. Um, I, When I first read the message to the district, I had a feeling that everyone was gonna get stuck up on that Thanksgiving travel language. And knowing that that wasn't the full story of why we're removing. It was a part, a small cog in the giant, um, <clears throat> excuse me, machine on why we're mi uh, missing. And every single email I got in response, that was what the complaint was about, right? And, and, and I know because my family went through it, we had to go pick up my daughter from school in Maine. And Mary Lee, it took her five days. I'm sorry. It took her, she was gone a week. Out, out of, ended up being out a week waiting for a negative test result. And, and that was just, it, by all definition, we traveled, you know, and that's what the, uh, 
in how long it took for the test results. So this is what we're living in, right? And people have to understand. The teachers have to understand. The administration have to understand. The parents have to understand that that is how quickly these things are going to happen, right? We're only in the beginning of December. The, you know, everything looks like it's still going to go up. This could and probably will happen again. I said this back in September. Knowing that, we have to be better as a district to be planning for this. You know, if we, if the decision was made to change out how, what remote was going to look like, did the, if the teachers were made aware of that, right, if the, the administration spoke or the uh, building leaders spoke, decided to change what remote was going to look like, and that trickled down to the teachers, as soon as that trickles down to the teachers, that becomes real and the information should be going out to the parents at that point. In case of emergency, this is what remote's going to look like. It's as simple as that. It really is. It, it, and I understand we're doing it shorthanded, right? And, and I understand why, one of the reasons why we are so sort of hair trigger is the fact that we are sort of, our hands are very much tied when it comes to staff. Right, and that's really, as much as we always say it's about the kids, that's sort of the biggest fear because if we lose staffing, we could lose months is, is the reality, right? And that's what people have to understand. And, and, and it, it has to be made clear that, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, we are in a position where, you know, you're erring on the side of caution. During this meeting, I got an email about yet another case. I haven't even heard of it from a for, on a school committee standpoint, I heard from uh, the Buker principal, right? So that happened during this meeting about another positive case in town, right? So this is how quickly it's moving. You know, I again, I, I like the message. I thought there was a lot better messaging going on, on that came out on Saturday than it had been coming, you know. But like I said, I knew that we were going to get stuck on, on that. <laughs> Excuse me, but I, I do think that we do need to be more proactive in saying this is the way we want to go. I mean, we just spoke to the middle school and high school principals. They're excited about what they're doing in this classroom. They want to be in the classroom. At the same time, we got to make sure they're focusing on, you know, it's, while it's awesome that we're making these strides in the classroom, we also have to be well aware that at the you know blink of an eye it can all go back to remote for an undisclosed amount of time right so we have to be preparing for that too i i, and I understand we're double if not tripling the workload of our entire staff in but i mean it is where it is where we are and you know i i need to say that sort of i need to say that here one to sort of say you know like i i see you mary beth i see the everything you're doing and, and, and everyone else in the COVID response team. And I appreciate everything you're trying, you know, you're taking what we have to say to heart. I really see that. And I know I, you know, um, don't always give you the easiest time. And I really appreciate that, you know, and so I want to make sure that's out there, you know, for everyone to hear that I, I see you taking in everything that everybody's saying and trying to do the best for, to, you know, you'll never get to uh, please everybody, but you're trying to please just about everybody, you know, and I need the parents to hear that, you know, this is, this is tough. I got a, you know, there's a 150 parents meeting about how to run the school district, but there are only four parents that, you know, uh, try to fill the empty chair of the school board. So, you know, what does that say too? But you know, that, that's can, where I am. Can I you know, say I mean, something? <laughs> Sorry, Dan. I don't know if I can talk. For three minutes. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I'm not. I'm not going to talk longer than that. So, um, I did email Dana and Mary Beth, and thank you so much for emailing me back because I was one of those parents hung up on the Thanksgiving travel. Um, but I don't think that it's wrong to be concerned about that. And clearly, other the I mean, other parents were concerned about it. What concerned me was that I did my job and I didn't travel and I didn't do anything with my family and I sacrificed for Thanksgiving. And I felt like 
we were getting unfairly punished. And I also saw like, if all the other school districts had closed down too, fine. Right. We are the, one of the only ones in the area that closed down. So I think those two things combined concerned me. It's one thing if the entire state shuts down or Beverly and Danvers and Salem and Gloucester shut down. But what I saw, and that might just be because of the communication, but clearly I'm not the only parent that thought that because other parents have had that concern. So I think that we really, I mean, I'm, I don't have the answer for how to necessarily address this, but if we think this is going to be happening again, we have to give a really good justification for this. And we also have to explain, we're not giving teachers that traveled and parents that traveled special dispensation because I've been hearing people going to Disney world, you know, which do whatever you want, but keep your kids home. That's kind of how I feel about it. If you're going to, if you're going to travel, but I just think we need better communication with the parents so that we're not hung up on this. Um, but I was actually happy to see that I wasn't the only parent that, that did get kind of upset by that communication. Cause it did seem like we were making special dispensation for people who had made their own choices kind of what, that's just what I wanted to say. I viewed it as it's a silver lining to this bad thing that we had to do is that this won't be a problem. So yeah, I guess it's always perspective on it. So, all right. Um, so in the interest of time, and I don't think that subcommittees have really met, we're gonna skip over eight um, and go to the consent agenda. Just real quick, Michelle, we're meeting Monday, right? To Monday? Whatever the eight, no, Tuesday, because it's the eight. eight. Tuesday, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Four o'clock. Four o'clock. Tuesday, December 8th at four. No, not you. <laughs> it's a second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Negotiations <laughs> committee. Sorry, Peter. That's why I threw up. When are we meeting, list, having the the listening? Yep, we'll Is get the ninth. Yeah, we'll get to What's that in the future topics, but Dana's gonna make a motion about the consent agenda. Okay, very good. I was just confused about the dates there for a second. Uh, does, uh, is anyone holding any items from the consent agenda? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask that, no. I'm sorry, yeah. Doesn't look like it. Okay. Uh, I move that the Hamilton Wenham Regional School Committee approve the consent agenda as presented. Um, in the exhibits and no changes shall be made. Is there a second? I'll second by Anna. Thank you, Anna. So there's no discussion on a consent agenda. So um, Peter? Yes. Anna? Yes. David? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Uh, Dana? Yes. And Michelle Bailey? Yes. That is six to zero. Um, okay, so topics for future meeting. So Peter, we have a full school committee meeting next Wednesday. Um, it's starting at seven. We thought that even though people might not be commuting, it's still, you know, craziness maybe until seven. So it's starting at seven. Um, we posted the agenda straight from the motion that was made. Um, whenever it was made. Uh, I can't remember the date. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is have a public hearing for an hour um, to hear um, to have a community hearing to facilitate dialogue with the superintendent and the school committee related to the learning models. And then we'll have like an hour, maybe, maybe a half hour, um, an, um, which will be a special meeting in the school committee to discuss the process for feedback about the plan and discuss improvements to the plan in the hybrid remote models. And then um, we're still trying to iron out what a um, learning management system agenda item would look like. And then we have one that's on hold for May. Well, um, let me, let me ask. Would, would you like to hear from an expert rather than me doing research? Would, could we invite this expert? We would need to figure out how much time that would take and how that would fit into our purview versus the administration's purview. So that's what we're trying to figure out. So you want me to 
I don't, I, Okay. I'd just like to talk to you, Peter, to figure it out. <laughs> all I, I want to do is say, hey, yeah, I'm available to talk to you. That's all we want. <laughs> um, Michelle, and instead of being blindsided by what we want to talk about, we kind of gave you some ideas about what we want to talk about. Just, yep, Anna? Um, so there's two things that I want to, uh, three things I want to bring up. The, um, I want to make really clear to the public that the meeting on the 9th is a dialogue Q&A as a forum. Um, it is an opportunity to ask questions and be answered. It is not one directional. So I want to make sure the public definitely knows that. Um, that we have the answers available. Yes. Um, somewhat related to that, I brought this up earlier. So we've now at this point heard an elementary update, a middle and high school update. We're continuing to get feedback from the parents. We ourselves have ideas. We will have a meeting on the 9th. I would like to put on the agenda for potentially maybe the 18th or sometime as soon as possible or the 16th, the 16th, September, December 16th. I think we as a committee need to have a, a vote or a consensus about some of these plan modifications as a group in the way that we did in August, where we talked about what we thought was most important and what we wanted the district to do. Because what's happening is we're helter skelter, you know, people, the high school's doing this, the middle school's doing this, elementary, when they shifted to what they're doing this week, what they're doing is not what we voted on. So the plan is changing all over. And I think we have some competing um, ideas and suggestions. I know that you know, and we need to talk about that. I think the district needs direction. So one agenda item, and I would like to put it on the agenda for the 16th feels about the right time because if the district's gonna make a change, they need direction sooner. That's one thing. Um, the second thing is I'd like to put into the meeting um, a reorganization of subcommittees so that Julia, once she gets officially sworn in, can be added to some subcommittees. So I think that needs to go onto an agenda at some point. Right, we would have taken care of that. That is on our plan, yep. Um, I don't understand the other one. When August, when we were giving feedback, we were giving feedback to a recommendation and we don't have a recommendation at this point. I think that we have heard lots of different ideas and we've had lots of different feedback. I think that we the committee need to exercise our leadership and give the, the district some direction about what do we want January to look like? Are we gonna to try to get K through five in? Are we gonna to try to get K through one in? I have suggested the idea of, is it viable to go remote at the high school and use that building? Are there other concentrations? Are there some classes that could be the whole cohort brought back together and still keep six feet? Are we gonna to try to engage the teachers union about less than six feet? I mean, there's a whole bunch of questions that we have not talked about that I think we should talk about, which is what I'm proposing the meeting on the 9th is, that is the topic for the 9th. And then from that, in the same way that we voted to approve a plan in August, we should vote to make some changes. And school committees across the Commonwealth have been voting to make changes. That is fully within our purview to do so. And, I feel like if we don't make some structural changes to the plan in some ways, the community is going to riot at our lack of leadership and their frustration level. Like, I don't see how we can ignore this. I think we have to vote on some kind of new direction somewhere. Operations of the schools is not within the jurisdiction of the school committee. So why did we vote on the reopening plan? Why did we vote on it then? Because it's a policy. So this is, New and because the state asked us to. The state did not ask us to monitor the plan. So respectfully, Michelle, school committees across the state have been making changes. You see, I see it every day. I'm sure you do too. We get those daily news digests. School committee in Berkshire County votes to bring K through five back. The school committee in Weymouth votes to do whatever. The school committees are the governing body for the district. We have authority, we have direction, there's a resource allocation. Are we gonna pursue more technology to do more Zooming? Are we gonna pursue a new set of, of distancing guidelines? Are we gonna reconfigure the spatial classrooms? Are we gonna have the principals look at every classroom and say, wow, I mean, for example, I know this, there's a kindergarten classroom at Cutler, Mrs. Goodchild's classroom that is so small, the entire class could come back and be in her room the whole week. 
are there places we can do this? School committees across the Commonwealth are doing this. So I respectfully disagree for you to say it's not our purview, because if that was true, then hundreds of school committees would be in violation of their purview because they've been voting all over the place to make plant changes. Like it just doesn't hold water for me. But they've been, and I don't know this to be a fact, but I'm assuming that they're working in relationship with their superintendent to get a proposal and then they're voting on the proposal. They're not dictating to the superintendent how to run the district. So when are we gonna have a proposal of some kind to make an actual bona fide modification? Because it's December 2nd now. And like, when are we gonna get there? I think when it's ready and then- If I could just speak to that a little bit. So in the presentations that you've seen, there are next steps. Um, at the, the elementary level, what we, we have shared with the, com the committee and the community is that our, our next step in terms of moving to more in-person is to, bring, to work to bring back kindergarten and first grade. Um, we are looking at, and so that, that is something we have shared with you, um, that that is our intent in terms of moving forward with that. Um, we are continuing to look at the timeline. I can share with you the last conversation was to look at that making an adjustment after the holiday break. Um, once I, we have a date that we can say, yes, we are ready to pull that off. We will bring that to you. Um, so that is, that is the proposal that after a lot of thinking and looking at what is possible in our schools um, as the next step at the elementary level. Um, at the high school level, you, you saw a lot of work being done in terms of do we start to bring kids back more into the building or do we focus our attention on looking at getting more sophisticated in our, in our streaming capacity to give kids more face-to-face -face time. So at the high school level, the work is, is headed in that direction. Um, and then you heard from the middle level that they, they are working both in terms of looking at that streaming piece and um, another a, a number of other pieces related to social emotional um, to, tr to take the next steps. Um, it, it, one of the things that, that I think you also heard from Principal Hovey is that that school's entire structure that used to be a middle school structure shifted as a result of the budget cuts. So they are dealing with an entire new structure. They are dealing with new devices from iPads. They are dealing with teachers that used to teach one grade level that are now teaching two grade levels. So they are a little bit further behind in terms of the streaming, but they are heading in that direction as well. So this has been a, an effort based on what did we hear across the district from surveying, from talking to our parents and bringing to you, these are the reasonable next steps that we see in order to continue to improve our programs. And where, do we, where are we moving first to try to get more in person and learning. And the answer to that is looking at K-1 to begin with. Um, so we, I, I believe that we are putting recommendations and, and sharing with you what we believe is the best are the best next steps in this process. And I, I would be worried about having ideas come out that are totally not vetted. Um, we know what people are looking for. We, we hear the same things you do. Um, and there is a lot of work with faculty um, looking at operationally what is possible. And the ideas that have been presented to you are the ones that the, the leaderships and the team and the teachers believe are the most viable next steps. So that will be on our agenda, it, but it will not be on our next meeting agenda. It, and what I what I will share with you the piece that that I, I want to be able to share with you is when we think and right now I'll tell you tentatively I believe it will be after the break that we would be sharing with you that we would be taking that step to bring K1 back in full full uh, for four days um, we are we are still fine tuning that plan still working out uh, a number of logistical issues but that that is something that that I believe I can share with you on the 16th as part of the superintendent's report. 
So then if we have questions about other things we would like you to look at the viability of, I guess that's what I'm coming back to is, I really do wanna understand what's the operational viability of bringing more than K1 back. I think a lot of families do. Why is that something that we're not having any sort of input or direction onto? I mean, what it, what it feels like you're saying is that we sit here passively waiting to approve something, think about something when we are in fact the voice of the community and trying to represent those interests. And I'm trying to say, there are other things that could be considered that I haven't heard anyone talk about. I haven't heard if they're vetted up. I agree with you. I don't know if they're viable or not. I'm asking you as the professional and as our administrator and as our superintendent to help us understand what could be done because I personally do not think that K-1 only is enough. I personally was fascinated to hear Principal Tracy talk about how happy the kids were using the hybrid schedule in remote. I'm simply reflecting what the community is saying and I'm saying I don't know that that's enough of a change and I don't know that it just it doesn't again it doesn't feel like it's enough and it doesn't feel fast enough and I don't feel like we the committee has had any input into it whatsoever and the fact that you know like I said not only are not only was there an about face about hybrid versus remote the plan itself is changing in ways that I'm not sure that I would support it changing. I don't know that I would have supported four days a week of Zoom for elementary kids. And I'm hearing from, I mean, that, that's what they did this week. They did something that's not what the plan was. And these changes are happening all over the place. I, I mean, frankly, I feel like I'm an elected member of a school committee and I don't actually know what is going on in my school district other than parents outraged. And then you come to us with an idea and say, we're thinking about it, we're working on it. But when, and then I offer other ideas and you're, it's just completely shut down. I mean, I, I honestly, I feel like I can't be more vocal in my frustration and I come to these meetings and I'm told it's not originally viable. And then our chair, Ms. Bailey, you know, perpetually shuts down that this is not our purview. This is not the place. This is not the thing. I don't understand what our purpose is if it's not to advocate for the community and press for changes. And it, I feel like I'm honestly talking into like a black hole right now. Like I'm screaming into the wind and I don't have anything else to do with it. And there's, we're just here waiting. Like it, it's beyond frustrating to me at this point. I think maybe one, and I'll connect back to a, an earlier concern you had, Anna, about, you know, why weren't we more prepared for the, in communicating in terms of what, what the, the, the new thinking is about remote. Um, and so trying to get caught up with those kinds of things and move forward the K-1, um, just to then start saying, okay, look at all these other options. When, when all of these things at some level or other has been considered by the team, and they've looked at this and said, here's what's viable, here's what we can do next. And when you ask for different models to be considered that are major shifts from what we're already doing, and we are trying to get better at what it is that we are doing, that, that runs the risk of, of I think being counter to what, what it is you're looking for, for a system that is, that is being proactive, that can communicate what is happening next. And there's been a lot of thought with staff, with looking at survey data, hearing what it is that people are concerned about um, and saying, here's what we can do next. Um, and it's not the end game, right? You know, getting kids back to full in person is not something that that happens with the flick of a switch, right? It happens incrementally. And the thinking is that let's first get K and one back. Let's see what the challenges are that come up with that. We know once we go past K and one, we would have to shift the social distancing. There is a lot of work that would need to be done in order to shift that social distancing. Is that 
that requires a lot of processing on a lot of different levels. That's a different level of question. So what we've said is, this is our next step. Let, let's, let us take that step. That is what a lot of districts are doing is their next step is to bring K and one back um, and then seeing how that goes. Um, because at the same time that that's happening, we do have escalating numbers, right? We do have a volatile situation. Um, and there gets to be a point at which we are so stretched and there are so many new and different things. You know, again, I gave the example of snow days. I, I can tell you, I don't think we are ready for it as a district yet for snow days. We, we got to get that taken care of really quickly. Uh, well, but I don't understand. Oh, can I just, for a second, so what I hear you saying, Mary Beth, mm -hmm. is you have exhausted a lot of um, thinking around what is the next best thing. And you've, you've identified a priority is to focus on K to one. What I hear Anna saying is she feels like there's more that should be done than just K to one. But she's not aware of all the work that you've done to prioritize K to one and why K to one is the priority. Yeah, and we can certainly- I feel like that's what you're saying. Yeah. I I I think I understand why K-1 is the priority because as I explained earlier, that's the foundational literacy piece. And as I said, we're missing the building blocks that lead to the future of learning. Like I understand that what I'm saying, and I, I feel like it's just falling on deaf ears over and over that the public ahead of that, like grades higher than that are looking for changes. Parents are saying how desperate they are for changes. And then the frustration level is here. You're saying we need time. We need to plan. It is December 2nd, neighboring districts have had their kids back in for the entire fall. And not to like be too sharp here, but you're saying the numbers are up, the rates are rising, we're all worried. Two weeks ago, you literally said, school is where kids are safest. It's not transmitting in schools. The data suggests that everyone's saying that the community is where it's spreading and schools are where it's not spreading. And now like you, I, I just feel like we are, Frankly, I don't feel like we're trying hard enough. And I understand that you've identified a priority. What I'm saying is we as a committee have a role also in setting the priorities. And I feel like we've been shut out of that conversation and we're not part of it, but that's what the public elected us to do was to help establish priorities for the district and work with you with your expertise to make them viable. But the act of setting the priority and figuring out what's gonna help our community I, I, I'm just responding to the, the sense of desperation from our community and the, the slowness of this response. You know, I, I, feel like, I feel like there's a lot of what we can't do right now. We can't do this, we don't have curriculum, we don't have that. I call it in my own life, I call it the EUR proposition, right? Everything is like, oh no, we can't do this, we can't do this. I wanna see a little bit more of like, well, what can we really do? And I just, we've, we've spent an entire first semester waiting for things, perfecting things. And then you say, you're trying to get better in the plan that we have, but we're not even following the plan that we approved. We've been changing it throughout the whole time. And that is part of the lack of stabilization. So I, I, I hear you. And yet at the same time, it feels unacceptable. I, I don't want to belabor this point. I think we could talk about it for hours. So I will, I will stop talking now, but the frustration level, I feel for me personally as an elected member, feels really high. And I think we're hearing from our community that they're, they're turning on us because we're not showing enough responsiveness. And that's a sign of trouble. I mean, that's, I just, that's where we are right now. And you know, I, I would share that, and I, I will say this to the community that is here and to the committee. This is a very, very difficult time. You know, in, in my conversations with people, I, I listen to families and I, if this is the wall, this is where so many families are. And you know what, if you talk to teachers, this is the wall, this is where so many teachers are. And we are pushing as hard as we can. There is innovative, exciting thinking. Every meeting that I go to, people are asking, how do we do it better? And, there, and we want to get it right. And we want to be able to have those proactive communications. And we know what is possible and what is not possible in this moment. And we are trying to give you good guidance 
about where this system goes next with the goal that all of us have about getting all kids back to school for in-person learning. That's where we all want to be. And part of my job and responsibility as your superintendent is to tell you where we are as a system and what is possible in this moment and what is not. And, and I am, and it is not my personal opinion. This is a result of lots of processing with our leadership team and our leadership team is processing with our, our teachers and with our students and they are looking for actively pursuing feedback from our families. We know what you know, Anna. We know people are frustrated. We understand that. And there are some things that we can fix quickly and there are some things that we cannot. And we need to take, we need to move forward at a rate that is going to make sense so that we do not have a situation in which we are trying to do too much and the whole thing falls apart. So, and, and I feel a responsibility as your superintendent to be clear when we are in that moment. Um, so I would like to thank David Polito for his foresight in um, recommending that we start this meeting earlier because as you said, it's gonna run late and it's now 11. Um, so with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Um, yeah, no, I just, I just had that question about what's our role when we, I sent that email to the, the, to the chair and the superintendent about the students at Patton Park, none of them wearing a mask. No. Do we have any role as a school committee? No, that would really be a public health issue, Peter. That I mean, could be shared with public health officials, but that's not something that we could take on. Yeah. No, so, so, so uh, Nurse Ting is listening. Should I forward it to her or should I forward it to? you? I think you should forward it to the public health people. And I also, from our discussions, I think they are share your level of concern already but I don't think it could hurt anything to forward that to them as well. Yeah, because it's not wearing a mask. I think that they, 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 share, they, share your, they share your anxiety about that as I feel pretty certain in saying that. Peter, if I could just hop in, if it's for uh, Patton Park, I would refer that um, to Rachel Lee is the public health nurse for Hamilton. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know Miss Nurse Lee. And, and it's something that comes up a lot at our response you know team meetings and uh you know i think if you reach out maybe they can throw it along to public safety yeah and uh, they, they could reach out to parents yeah. you mean we, i drove by today and saw the same thing and i hear what you're saying yeah um peter your question reminded me um not to belabor point back in the interest of emails that go unresponded to a while ago i had messaged about um our letters and notification, could the COVID response team take that up? And I got some nice responses back from the nurses of the group, but I'm wondering, or I guess putting in a request again, that uh, we talk about the message and the letter we send out when there are positive cases. I know that David has expressed frustrations as well. Um, I don't know if that's a topic for a future meeting or maybe that's a topic for the COVID response team, but I would still like to have a little bit more clarity and potential change about how we message are positive cases. I, and again, I've, got, I've gotten some good feedback about uh, that, what I shared out. And I actually noticed in the messaging that went out tonight, a few few lines that were taken right out of there that I think, like I said, I, I see everyone hearing, I do see them moving. And I do also see you in not being satisfied at the speed in which this stuff is moving too. So um, yeah, I just did want to say that because I don't think it was, I think I was re uh, just replied to personally, but I did get some feedback on that, thanking me for, and, and, and saying that they agree that some of the messaging in there was, was good. Yeah, David, I'm referring to an email I sent uh, I, to the COVID response team a while ago. And, and a motion to adjourn. <laughs> I think uh, I move we adjourn at 11.05 p.m. Is there a second? Second. All right. Um, Peter? Yes. Anna? Yes. David? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Uh, Dana? Yes. And Michelle Bailey? Yes.
All right. So next week at seven. And then for some of us, next week at four. <laughs> okay.